Hey, what's up everybody? It's Damon, and on this channel we usually talk about the intersection between Christian spirituality and leftist politics, and talk a lot about liberation theology. And over the last few months, as this channel has been growing, and also on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Damon, as we've been doing streams over there, I keep getting people say, Hey Damon, I like what you talk about, we should do some sort of leftist Bible study type thing. And recently I realized, you know what, I need to actually upload what you're actually going to see right now. And I recorded this back in 2017. I just left evangelicalism and just left my job as a youth and young adults pastor in evangelicalism. And I felt so excited to talk about something new. I felt excited to keep communicating the things that I was communicating, but actually be honest about them. Actually be honest about the things that I had learned about the Bible, theology, philosophy, in order to get better at teaching this stuff. And so one of the ideas I had was to do some courses on different topics and put them up on this website that was just four courses. And as I started recording some, I realized actually I'd rather do some other type of content. And so I just let it go and didn't do anything with it. And I had this course, this three hour course on the Bible that I just never did anything with, never uploaded anywhere. And now I decided to edit it together and put it up here. And I'll say this for some context. When I made this course, my mission at the time was, okay, let's make progressive Christianity louder. Let's just introduce super basic general progressive Christianity 101 to a generalized audience. And then over time, and I was doing this on YouTube too, over time I realized actually I want to hone in more on the leftist politics side of it and be more specific with the stuff I talk about. This was before that decision. And so, as you watch this, this will be very general, very 101 for progressive Christian reading of the Bible. And when I say progressive, I mean integrating the insights of modern scholarship. And so I was just trying to give people basic resources for how to come at this from a perspective that integrates the insights of modern scholarship. So it doesn't get that deep into looking at this from a leftist perspective, but of course you can see a bunch of my videos talking about that, and I plan on releasing more videos after this that will actually get more specific on that. And also, looking back at this course, I realized that I now use language a little bit differently. Certain words and phrases that I used to use, I wouldn't use today, or just replace them with different words and phrases. And instead of just re-recording this whole thing so I could be more eloquent than I used to be or so I could use different words or phrases or focus in more on different stuff. I decided to just upload this because there was a special energy during this period of my life that makes me really value this thing that I recorded in 2017. And the time and energy that could go into me just recreating this whole thing could go into me creating supplemental material where I'm able to go deeper from a different perspective, some 102 stuff. And so that's what I'm going to do. And so enjoy this three hour course on the human book, a human book. And then tomorrow, I'm also going to drop a course, a uh, very much shorter course, about Lectio Divina, sacred reading, which is just a very contemplative way of reading the Bible. So. Enjoy all the Bible content that's going to be thrown at you all. And make sure you join my Discord server. The link is in the description. And on there, we're going to go way deeper on this stuff and read the Bible together. I'm still working out the details on how we're going to do it, but I know we're going to do it in there. So make sure you're in there to stay updated on what we're going to be doing. And there's just so many cool people in there talking about this stuff that we're all interested in. So join that. Subscribe. Whole bunch of more videos coming at you and enjoy this. What's up, friends? Welcome to A Human Book, the Bible for the Post Religious. My name is Damon Garcia. Now, I have grown up with this text my entire life. 
reading it, discussing it, hearing about it, and even teaching it. I have years of ministry under my belt, youth and young adults ministry, where I've taught these Bible stories and talked about these Bible stories in schools and churches, and I love this book so much. But one of my passions is also to widen it up a bit, to not let it stay confined in religious circles, but to go back to what the text was actually initially meant to be, which I would say, not a religious book, but a human book, a book that everyone can relate with, that everyone can come to with their own story, and it can come alive for them in whole new ways. Because so often we've been told that the Bible is just a literal account of historical events, or to, or to be read as like a textbook, or a constitution, a list of rules. But actually, the Bible is way bigger than that. It's a library of diverse ideas filled with stories and poems and images and metaphors of ancient people describing their experience with transcendence, describing their experience with the God of the universe, which of course is beyond language, which is of course is why this thing is filled with so many images and symbols that need to be broken down a bit but most importantly, need to be experienced. So I'm gonna, throughout this course, give you different methods and tools and insights about how we can approach this Bible in a bit of a non-religious way, in a human way, in a deeper way. I'm really excited to do this. This is probably my favorite thing to talk about because my passion is to open this wide up for you guys. And so we're gonna go through a few sections. First, we're going to talk about how the Bible became a religious book and what it was before that. And we have a few lectures that we're going to go through under that section. And then the next section is what's in the Bible. And then we have a few lectures in there where we go through the narrative of the whole entire story. Super big picture. And then we zoom in and see how can we see that narrative and that pattern through each and every book of the Bible. Then the next section is how to quit reading the Bible with Western eyes. Because the Bible comes from the East. Every figure within it and every figure who wrote it is from the East. The ancient East, which is way different than the ways that we now approach texts. Way different in the ways that we now approach truth. And way different than the ways that we approach spirituality in the West. Next. We're going to finish off by giving you the section, How to Read the Bible. In this one, we're going to give you methods of engaging with the text, how to read story by story by story, what to look for, how to get the most out of it, and how it can actually help you grow and transform. Like I said, this is my favorite thing to talk about. So let's go through this adventure together, and I hope you enjoy what we talk about because... This just might change your life. Welcome to the first section, how the Bible became a religious book and what it was before that. And before we get into anything, I want to get you guys to consider having a beginner's mind as we approach this. The beginner's mind is an old Zen Buddhist concept, and it's about approaching things as a beginner, as a learner, as a disciple, as opposed to approaching it as an expert. Because in the expert's mind, there's only a few possibilities because you already know how it works as you stand back and judge. But in the beginner's mind, there are many, many possibilities. So I want you guys to try your best to try to just erase everything you've ever been told about what the Bible is, what's in it, and what it's for as we try to come at this together and discover what this is all about. So the first lecture in this section is called From Canon to Sola Scriptura. And the canon is the 66 book collection that we call the Bible. So we're going to talk about how and why that was put together. And then we're going to talk about the holy contradictions, because there's a lot of contradictions in the Bible. Let's just be straight up about that. And we're going to talk about why there are contradictions, how that ended up being put in there, and if it really was 
put together by a council as a canon? Why would they include the contradictions? Stuff like that. And then the last lecture would be a text in travail, which travail is like painstaking labor and talk about how the Bible actually works. So let's talk about the canon. The canon is the collection of 66 books that we call the Holy Bible. Because the Bible isn't just one long book written by one guy. The Bible is 66 separate books written over 1500 years collected by people. And the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, is a collection of writings from the Jewish tribe, the ancient tribe of Israelites. The New Testament is the collection of writings from the first Christian community. Now, canon, that word, let's just break that down, is, comes from the Greek that means rule or measuring stick. And we use that word even for a lot of things today, for like TV series or movie series, any sort of saga or series. Like we could say this movie series the canon is the main story that we all agree is the main story. And then maybe they made a video game based off of it. But whatever storyline is in that video game is non-canon. It's not a part of the main storyline. With uh, Star Wars Episode Eight that just came out, a bunch of people hated it so much that they put up a bunch of online petitions for people to sign to eliminate it from the main Star Wars canon. It was like, we hate this so much, let's just pretend it's not part of our main storyline. Canons are a big deal. And the first canon, the Jewish canon, the canon of the Old Testament, or as the Jewish people call it, just the Hebrew Bible. This was a collection of texts all written in Hebrew, some bits in Aramaic. And the reason that they put this together, let's remember, all reasons for putting a canon together is for group identity. And when they put this together during this time, it was after Rome had completely destroyed their temple in 70 AD. And before that, the center of Jewish spirituality was the temple. Everything was centered around going to the temple all the time to make sacrifices, to celebrate their particular holidays. And the priests were there and their main role was to help the people make the sacrifices at the temple. The Romans destroy the temple after the Jews try another revolt. And then another big thing that was making things really confusing and traumatic was that this new Christian movement had just started and there was a bunch of people leaving the Jewish community for this new Jesus thing, whatever it is. And in the midst of this confusion, trauma, and tragedy, they're like, let's look at our stories Let's look at our writings and let's collect them together, edit them a bit, arrange them around to decide what is the story of our people? What stories and poems can we put together to remind ourselves who we are in the midst of all this craziness? So in the beginning, when people put together a closed off canon, it's not oppressive in any way because this whole idea of this is our books and everything else is excluded, completely closed off, can sound a little harsh and oppressive, but initially it's beneficial for group identity. And then the Christian canon was put together around the second or third century when they looked around and saw all this disagreement among the first Christian community. There was many sects of Christians already. Some of them were using Jesus ideas to commit acts of violence. Some of them were using the Jesus stuff to turn it into this whole magic supernatural stuff. And so they're like, we need to come together and remember what is this story? What is our story? And how should we live based off this story that we all agree on for our group identity? And when they decided this, they had questions that they asked because there was a bunch of stuff that they could choose from. And so the first question they would ask is, is it apostolic? Because Jesus, his first movement, he gathered disciples, followers, learners, students, and then he sent them out to go teach this stuff to others. And by being sent out, that's how they became an apostle. That's what apostle means. Disciple means student. Apostle means sent out. And so they thought as they're going through these different texts and deciding, does it come from one of those initial people 
that Jesus sent out as apostles. The next they would ask, is it orthodox? Orthodox means correct teaching. So they would ask, does it align with the teaching that we got from the apostles? Or does it contradict? And then the other question they would ask is, is it Catholic? And Catholic, before Roman Catholic Church existed, Catholic initially meant universal. Catholic does mean universal, worldwide, general. So when they would say the Catholic Church, they're actually saying the whole church. But for a really long time, the Catholic Church was the only church. And then people split off from them. And they just kept calling themselves Catholic, even though we all know Catholics aren't the only Christians. So this is Catholic with a lowercase c. And so they would ask, is it Catholic? Does it apply to the whole worldwide church? Or does it apply to just a particular community? And then the last question they would ask is, has it shown over time to nurture the church and these early Christian communities? Because if it has, then it will probably continue to nurture future Christian communities. And so these were the criteria that they had for picking letters and gospels and stories to decide what are the books that we're going to decide make up the New Testament and add to the Hebrew Bible. And really, this is when I would say it became a religious book. The word religious comes from the Latin religare, which means to bind together. Ligament comes from the same exact Latin root, to bind. And when someone usually hears, oh yeah, religion means to bind, they might immediately start thinking of like oppressive religion that's always excluding and closing off. And they're like, oh yeah, that's awful. Religion is to bind. But no, it's think bind together the same way that ligaments bind together. It's for your benefit. It's to embrace and create a group identity and a story that we all walk in together. And this is when it became that. Before, I would suggest it wasn't a religious book or a religion, a religious collection of stories, but a human book, a human collection of stories and poems and complaints and crying out. Because this is written by a Jewish tribe that was oppressed again and again and again, empire after empire. And they wrote these things as a way of trying to understand everything that was going on around them and trying to stay in relationship with their God that had called them to be a tribe that blesses all the other tribes. And as they try to do that, they're being oppressed and critiquing empires that are only after their own self-preservation. Same with the Christian community. They're reminded of who they're supposed to be and they're crying out to each other. Remember our goal. Remember what Jesus called us to. Remember to, to be a part of this means to be the family that blesses all of the other families. And in the midst of that, God is on our side in the midst of our suffering. And we are also on the side of each other in the midst of our suffering. Even the initial Greek translation from religion. Like for example, when James says in James 1 27, pure and righteous religion that God honors is taking care of the widows and orphans. And when he uses that word religion in that sense, he uses the Greek word thraskeia, which pretty much means to worship. But even the root of that means to really cry out because that's what worship is. It's looking around in the midst of this crazy, tragic, traumatic life and crying out, whether it's out of joy and gratitude or confusion and wonder and lament and trying to figure out what's going on. We cry out to the heavens together in solidarity. That's what religion initially was when these texts were being written was humanity's method of crying out in the midst of this. And then I would say it became a religious book in the way we know religion now today, when it became canonized, when it became closed off. And as time went by, as the Catholic Church stayed, and around the 1000s, there was a split between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, just the West Church and the Eastern Church, and then in 1500, there was another split 
which was the Protestant Reformation, or you could call it the Protestant Reformation. This is when Martin Luther and a bunch of others saw the injustice that the Roman Catholic Church was doing, which is really manipulating people, saying certain things were in the Bible that really weren't, and letting all the authority come from the high priests and the Pope instead of the Bible. And Martin Luther would look back at the Bible and think, we have totally strayed off from the story that we're supposed to walk into together. And so one of the many critiques he had was no longer put authority on the Pope and the high priests. Let's put all of the authority in the Bible. And this created the doctrine sola scriptura, which is Latin for scripture only. But it could get a little complicated even when you do that, because the Bible does it really work the way Martin Luther was hoping it would? Because he read the Bible, gained a certain interpretation from it, took advantage of the new printing press, and translated it into the language of the people and printed all kinds of copies so everyone else could get their hands on the Bible because the Bible is the new authority now. And he was under the impression that by doing this, everyone would be able to read the Bible for themselves and get the same interpretation that he was getting when he was reading it. But the Bible is so much more messy, complicated, and unruly than that. And that's why we have tens of thousands of denominations that have all split off from the Protestant Reformation. Because when you put the Bible at the center of your spirituality, the Bible doesn't work for self-preservation. The Bible doesn't have a singular ideology that we could all just align with. The Bible has several diverse ideologies, perspectives, and metaphors, and ways of looking at things. And so when the leaders of the Protestant Reformation are encouraged, read the Bible for yourselves, what winds up happening is they look around at their church, and like Martin Luther say, this isn't what the Bible says we should be doing, and start their own denomination doomed to have that same thing happen to them from one of their members. And Catholics, traditional Catholic theology, also say that there is a singular interpretation, a singular reading from the Bible. But differently, they don't say, so read it for yourselves and find out. They would say that singular interpretation comes from the Pope and the priests. Eastern Orthodox similarly says, there is a singular interpretation already taken care of, but they would say the singular interpretation comes from the early church fathers. While Protestants say, singular interpretation, just sit down and read it. And of course, that's how we have tens of thousands of Protestant denominations. And every single institution, its primary goal is self-preservation. So when you put an institution around the Bible, Bible as its center authority. Self-preservation doesn't really last. One of the biggest chunks of the story of the Bible is Israel getting a land from God and being told, I'm giving you this land so you can be a nation that blesses all the other nations. And if you don't, if you become like all the other empires, if you become like Egypt, the empire that enslaved you and let your own desire for self-preservation cloud everything else, then I'm going to kick you guys out of this land I gave you. And that's exactly what they did. They get kicked out. And so there's a huge critique for letting your desire for self-preservation cloud every other goal and value and desire. And that's why it's so hard to have an institution around the Bible, because the Bible is messy, complicated, diverse. And because of that, I think that's also why so many churches and institutions that make the Bible the central authority have to end up watering down the radical message of the Bible, which is why I think some of you are here. Some of you may have heard Bible stories or flipped through it a couple times and were inspired and felt a sort of heaviness or transcendence, like there's something here that's really miraculous and important. But when I've heard other people teach me the Bible, it just felt so dry, watered down, and awful. In this case, I want to see the Bible for what it is and unleash the radical message inside of it 
And that's what we're going to keep exploring as we continue. So we talked about in the last lecture that the Bible actually does a terrible job at uniting people around a singular ideology, because that's not how the Bible works. Because the Bible is actually a library. It's a collection of diverse ideas, the same way every other library that you walk into is a collection of diverse ideas. And yet so many people today are taught to approach the Bible kind of like a constitution. Like here's the list of detailed, exact things that we need to take literally and then follow. Or sometimes we're even taught to approach the Bible like a textbook. Like you want the answers? Look it up here. Boom, answer. The Bible doesn't work like that. The Bible is a library of diverse ideas. And the Bible was written 66 books by at least 40 authors over at least 1,500 years on at least three different continents, later gathered up and canonized. So of course there's going to be a diversity of ideas, and of course there's going to be contradictions. But I want us to look at contradictions a little bit differently than this. Uh, one of my favorite Walt Whitman quotes from one of his poems is, Do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. I love that line so much. You're telling me I contra tra contradict myself? Of course I contradict myself. I'm, I'm a human. I'm a large human that's able to think many different ideas. And let's approach the Bible in that way. Does the Bible contradict itself? Fine, it contradicts itself. That's because it's large and it contains multitudes. The scholar Pete Enns, who also writes a lot about the Bible and biblical scholarship, he has a lovely analogy about contradictions. He suggests the way we understand contradictions, maybe we shouldn't even put on the Bible. And he gives this analogy of, if I were to say, I love oatmeal, and then immediately turn to my friend and say, I hate oatmeal, that would be a legit contradiction. But if I said, I love oatmeal, and then 20 years later say, I hate oatmeal, we wouldn't really call that a contradiction. We would call that a progressed change in belief over time. And his third example is, if I said, I love oatmeal, but my son said, I hate oatmeal, that's not a contradiction either. That's two different people giving their two different opinions and ideas within the same context. And the Bible is filled with those last two examples. People changing over time how they think about things and how they see God and people in life. And one person saying one thing, and another person and another continent at a different time saying another. That's how it works. That's how growth works. That's how the diversity of ideas works. And that's especially how oral traditions work. Because way before the Bible was written down, it existed as oral tales told around a campfire to remind the specific tribe, what kind of people are we? And what is our story? And a very unique characteristics of oral traditions is one, we don't ever really know when or where they originated from. And two, another common characteristic with oral tales is that they're always adapted to fit the particular context that they're telling it in. And so because of that, back then when people would hear these oral tales, they wouldn't hear them and think everything in this, first off, they wouldn't think everything in this is literal because one, they would understand that this is a story not for the purpose of give me, giving me historical facts, but this purpose is to unite me around an idea that my whole entire tribe unites around. And second of all, they would also not view it as this detailed historical fact list because it was adapted for them and they were aware that it was adapted for them. And these ideas would just kind of exist in their head, had to memorize them because they couldn't read. And then they would live it out in their own life. And they would find that the actual truth of oral tales is how it's lived out in day-to-day -day life not in the details of the initial telling. That's how all of these stories in this Bible work. I would even suggest 
when a story has contradictions and it's about the biggest things that matter, then it's bound to have contradictions. In court cases, when someone gives a testimony about an assault that happened to them, and they have zero contradictions at all, everything matches up detail perfectly, that's actually a sign that they're lying. But when they give a testimony and everything's kind of all over the place, the times are a little bit fudged, they kind of say one thing and then contradict themselves in another place, that's actually a sign they're telling the truth. Because that's what trauma does to our brains. It short circuits it and totally changes how we see it. And those are the types of stories that are being told again and again and again in this book, especially because all these stories and poems and letters are referring to experiences beyond language as a totally other type of language. When your friend comes to you and is crying out to you, whether it's about extremely good news or extremely bad news, everything they say is going to be filled with metaphors, poetic language, and contradictions. And it would be ridiculous to stop them and say, whoa, wait, wait, you contradicted yourself there. No, the purpose, is, the purpose of listening to your friend when they're telling a story like that is to catch the feeling of the story that they're telling and be excited with them or be in sadness and solidarity with them. That's what these stories actually are. And the ones who put them together and canonized them knew that. None of the people who agreed, let's put all these books together, not, at no point was a criteria of it not contradicting each other. No, 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 no. They knew that there was contradictions, historical contradictions, factual contradictions, detailed contradictions. They chose to leave them in because they knew it wasn't that kind of book. They knew it wasn't a textbook or a constitution. They knew it was a library of diverse ideas that show the world that our tribe walks into and our calling as we apply this, this, these writings to our everyday, day-to-day -day life. An example, Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Genesis 1, the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, and Genesis 2, the second chapter. Big contradictions. First off, Genesis 1 is a poem. It's not a historical scientific analysis of how the world came to be. No, it's obviously a poem with patterns and rhyming structure that you can't really get in the English translation, but was initially in there. And it says in the creation of the world that first God created the heavens, the earth, filled the earth, made the sky, made the sun, basically all of nature. Then he made all animals to fill it. Then the last day, God created man and woman. Genesis 2 is another creation story. It's not a continuation of Genesis 1. It kind of starts over and gives a different perspective of the creation. But in this version of the creation story, the order is a little bit different. Nature is created, and then man is created, like male. The male is created. And then a bunch of animals are created when this male says that he's lonely. And God is trying to give this male a partner by creating animal after animal after animal. And he says no to each one, meanwhile naming them as he says no to each one. And then God takes a rib out of this male and makes woman. So in this order, it's males, animals, then woman. But we just read that it was all animals, then men and women on the same day. Some may say, okay, well, this is just a zoomed in version of Genesis 1. It's not. It contradicts itself, and that's okay, because when they put this together, they understood very much that these stories share diverse ideas, but both of them are telling our tribe something very important that we want to remember as the story of our people. Another contradiction that's pretty popularly pointed out is between a story in Samuel and story in Chronicles. Samuel and Chronicles tell a lot of the same stories and series of events. One of them is when King David is told to make a census of all his people in his kingdom. Samuel's version says that God told David to take the census 
And then when he does, he's punished for it because there had to have been some sort of pride within him of seeing how many more do we have than all the other kingdoms. But then in Chronicles version, which was written many, many years later, they say Satan was the one who tempted David to take this census. And Satan wasn't even that much of a concept in the Old Testament. And so it's, it's kind of like randomly thrown in there. But the word Satan and the concept of Satan was developed way later in Israelite spirituality. And so when these people in Chronicles say that Satan was the one that did it, not God, it's because they've progressed to a different point of view and they're giving this other point of view and the ones who collected these writings and put them side by side was aware because they knew that this is a diverse set of ideas, a d diverse library collection that we all can gather around and build something of our lives from. And then the last one I'll say is in the gospel is itself. Because you may say, oh, well, that's, that's the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, we got it right because Jesus came. <laughs> Mark says on Jesus' last night when he was arrested, Jesus is so bummed out, so sad, so, so much in grief that he's crying and sweating, basically blood. And he's on his face crying out to God, please, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. If it's possible for me to not go through this, please let it happen. And then he gets arrested. And John's version of the gospel story, same night, Jesus isn't in the garden because he was hiding out there and grieving. Jesus is in the garden because he knows that's where he's supposed to be because that's where the soldiers are going to arrest him. And he's there. And when the soldiers see him and say, are you Jesus? And he says, I am. The soldiers are the one who go face down, not Jesus. And then Peter tries to retaliate against these soldiers and save Jesus from being arrested. And Jesus rebukes him and says, Peter, should I not take this cup that is about to be given to me? Complete opposite stories because they're both told for different purposes, adapted to specific communities. And they all have something to say. But the thing they don't have to say is, this is a literal, historical, factual account. Instead, what they have to say is, let this story move in you, move in your heart. See all the ways that it applies to your life, all the things it makes you think of, and talk about it with others. And this is why the holy contradictions are left in, and this is why the Bible is a lot more messy, tricky, unruly than we may think. Okay, in this third lecture, we're going to talk about the Bible as what Rene Girard, an anthropologist and cultural theorist, calls a text in travail. Travail means like painstaking labor. And I think it's best understood when we refer to the Bible as a text in travail. It makes a lot of things jump out because when we read the Bible as a constant growth struggling to grow, like a woman pains in labor, the Bible starts to form a bit of a pattern that you might not have seen before. This pattern is often worked out through three steps forward, two steps back, which is how actual growth works. We get a part of this new, absolutely miraculous, positive revelation of this is it. This is how I should be. This is what I need to give to the world. And you make this huge leap of growth. And then you're like, uh, actually, I'm pretty tired today. And then you go back a little bit. But you're a little bit further than you were. You're a step above. But it's three steps forward, two steps back. Three steps forward, two steps back. I'm sure all of us can remember times where we have progressed and grown. And it's three steps forward, two steps back. And so several times in the Bible, you get little glimpses of huge leaps of this message of unconditional love. 
And then the next story is about that same tribe that were like, yes, we're about unconditional love, taking care of the poor, maintaining justice and righteousness. Next chapter. Oh, but not that tribe. Because that's how growth works. And you even see in the trajectory from beginning to end, commandments that are given at one point as the next step forward. That doesn't really work later because now we're ready for the next step forward. An example is one of the most common known Bible commandments is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This is from Exodus when God is giving his people instruction, law. And one of the instructions that God gives is eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, which is really the punishment must meet the crime. And this may sound a little bit harsh and not as progressive as we are today. Like, so you're just going to have revenge on every single person that does you wrong? That doesn't sound very loving. But it was a huge step forward in that time period. Because in that time period, there was no concept of the punishment meeting the crime. If somebody came and took your donkey, then you would go over to them, take their donkey and their cow and maybe their wife. And by God introducing eye for eye, tooth for tooth, he's saying, no, 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 no. The punishment must meet the crime. Because revenge always is escalating. We always want to get the person back way worse than they got us. And then God's new rule is, if he takes your donkey, then you take a donkey back. And then when we get to the New Testament and Matthew, when Jesus is preaching his Sermon on the Mount, he says, You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. This is a whole other step. This is a step toward unconditional love. This is a step toward peace and nonviolence. That if someone hurts you, hits you, wounds you, don't respond by doing the same thing back. Respond with peace Love, nonviolence. And yet the ancient Israelites who were in a culture of, if they get me, I'm going to get them way worse and there's no other type of living that I know of. If they were told, if someone hits you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. That, that would be too much. They wouldn't understand. They would immediately give up on that command because they needed to learn Progressively, slowly, gradually. That's how actual growth works. In order to learn unconditional love, you first need to learn conditional love. In order to learn how to truly love everyone for who they are no matter what, you first need to learn how to love your family. And three steps forward. Two steps back is what we see again and again in the Bible as we read stories of great love, peace, nonviolence, justice, and stories of awful violence, terror, and regressive ways that we open the Bible and see and say, oh yeah, that's why I don't open that thing. And Jesus, when he is preaching, he catches the stream within the biblical text of love and justice, and ignores the parts where they're taking a few steps back whenever he quotes the scripture to people when he teaches. Because he knows the people he's teaching, the Jews, they know this text very well. So he quotes it a lot. And in one of his first sermons in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 4, he opens the scroll and he teaches from this verse in Isaiah. He quotes Isaiah and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That sounds pretty inspiring. And that sounds like a story of maintaining justice, peace, and love. And Jesus is saying, I'm a part of that story. And I'm here to encourage you to return to that story. But here's the thing. That passage in Isaiah, Jesus stopped mid-sentence. He didn't finish it. He skipped the next part. Because in the actual passage in Isaiah, it says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor 
and the day of God's vengeance. Because for the original writer in this book of Isaiah, it was written in the context of we are a tribe that's being oppressed again and again and again, empire after empire. Now, as I'm writing this, Babylon is the one that's enslaving us, oppressing us, killing us, humiliating us. And as we cry out for God to save us, one of the things we're also crying out for is justice that all this atrocity and violence that we're seeing the Babylonians commit against us, we're also crying out to God that he'll bring some vengeance on them because of all the vengeance they have brought on us and all of our families and friends. So it's a bit of a justified prayer to cry out to God for vengeance. But Jesus skips it. Jesus quotes the verse, about bringing the day of the Lord's favor, and he stops. Because for Jesus, he's catching the stream of the consistent steps forward, leaving out the steps back. And I think by observing how Jesus reads the Bible, we should also approach the Bible in the same way. Catch the stream of the steps forward toward greater unconditional love, justice, and peace. While understanding that as humans, are journeying toward that, there's going to be a lot of mishaps, mistakes made, and steps backward, because that is actually how growth works. And another reason I love this title, A Text in Travail, is because travail is also similar to the word struggle, or to wrestle. And Israel means to wrestle or to struggle with God. They first got this name, it talks about in the book of Genesis, the first book, with the story of their ancestor Jacob. And Jacob is on the run. He's totally confused about who he is. He stole his brother's inheritance and birthright and then ran away. And in the midst of being confused of who he is, what his purpose is, what family does he actually belong to, full of fear and confusion, an angel appears to Jacob. It's later revealed that the angel was actually God. And God incarnated in this man or angel or figure. It's it's very unsure what it is. It uses the word man, angel, and God in this story. This figure wrestles with Jacob. They struggle together. And then Jacob ends up getting this figure in a chokehold, basically, and says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me until you give me a blessing, until you give me something to actually live for. And he says, what is your name? He says, Jacob. And he says, now your name is Israel because you have wrestled with God and have won. And Jacob walks away from this wrestling match with God with a limp that he keeps for his entire life, remembering that struggle that he had with God, remembering that his closest encounter, intimate encounter with the divine was a struggle, a wrestling match that leaves you walking away with a limp. And Israel becomes the name of the whole tribe who exists in relationship with this God through the struggle, through the wrestling of it. The relationship stays close and intimate by keeping the struggle in. This is how all relationships work. Relationships are usually viewed as toxic and you hurry, need to hurry up and get out of them if only one person in the relationship is making all the decisions and the other person is like, yes, 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 sir, yes, ma'am, I'll do whatever you say. You make all the decisions. No, no, no. What makes a relationship actually last is when they're able to contend with one another, able to wrestle with one another, able to go back and forth, argue, realize the faults in themselves through debating and arguing and questioning. That is how a relationship actually grows and sustains. And that is how God chooses to have a relationship with people through the wrestling, through the struggle. The book of Psalms is another great example. The book of Psalms is this 
probably the biggest is the biggest book in the Bible, 150 chapters right in the middle. And it's filled with poems and songs to God. And some of them are, thank you, God, for everything you've done for us. Praise to you. You are greater than anything. And then the next one will be, God, where are you? It feels like you've totally, you have totally abandoned us. Why? We cry out, we look for you, and you are nowhere to be found. Next one, God, we have all our hope in you, and you have done so much for us. And so the entire Psalms, if you just read through those one after the other, you see this wrestling, this struggling with God, and how the relationship stays sustainable and strong because it is a struggle, a wrestling, a constant questioning, constant fighting, constant being able to cast all their cares on the divine. Both the, wow, thank you, I'm so blessed, and the, I can't even believe God is there. And if there is a God, it seems like he's straight up evil. Because sometimes we feel that. And that's part of the struggle. That's part of the growth. That's part of relationships in general. And that's definitely part of our wrestling relationship with God. And the Bible is about that type of relationship between the divine and humans. And that's why I love it. So now what? We're gonna do these sections talking about now what and how it can apply to you at the end of each section. So first off, we could set down any idea of the Bible being a textbook or a constitution or a book filled with historical literal facts of any kind. The Bible isn't that, it doesn't work that way. And I also want to encourage you guys to do a couple practices. We're gonna actually read the Bible. We're gonna open it up and read it. First, I want you guys to open up to either one or more of these passages. It's up to you. This passage is on the screen. And I want you to read one or more of these without the burden of reading it literally or as a factual historical story. Read it as if you would read an old oral tale. If someone gave you, hey, this was an ancient story that they used to tell in the ancient Near East. If someone gave that to you, you wouldn't immediately think, oh, this is a historical event that happened in the ancient Near East. No, no, no. This is a story that they used to tell and that helped a specific tribe grow and learn and love together. Read one of these passages or more like that, with that perspective and mindset. And then here's another practice that I want you guys to do. I want you to read through some of these Psalms that we're putting up and read and experience the struggle. See the, the ways that they go back and forth between we love you, God, and where are you, God? Because both are equally a part of a relationship. So do those and then we'll go on to the next section. Welcome to section two, where we're gonna talk about what's in the Bible. Now remember, we need to have a beginner's mind here. Some of you have been told what the Bible is, what's in it, what's the story of the Bible. And some of you have heard a lot of pretty messed up stuff when being told what's in the Bible. A common misconception of what the story of the Bible is this six line narrative. I got this illustration from Brian McLaren and usually when typical evangelical pastors give the story of the Bible, they sometimes tend to give this story where we start in Eden, which is perfection a state of absolute perfection. Then humans mess it up, they sin, disobey God, and we enter into the fall because of original sin. We fall from perfection and innocence to a state of sinfulness because of original sin. 
and we are condemned. Sorry, I forgot how to spell condemn. <laughs> condemnation. There you go. You know what it says. Condemnation. And then it's like you have a choice here. We're all condemned. We're all in a state of sinfulness. We're all a bunch of natural born sinners. And then you have the choice of salvation with Jesus. And if you choose salvation, then you go to heaven. If you don't, then you go to hell. Now this is a troublesome way of reading the Bible because first off, what this is really saying is God created everything perfect, then we messed it up and we're all sinful. But if you believe that Jesus can save you, then you go to heaven. If you don't believe, then you go to hell which is kind of strange because the story is Jesus died for everyone, but only if you believe it, only if you believe that it happened. And even more troublesome is this is actually more of a Greek platonic way of reading the world. This is actually more similar to the allegory of Plato's cave than it is the Bible, where you start with a state of absolute perfection, the absolute perfect ideal. Then you fall through illusion deep, dark into the cave, and now you're in a state of changing and decaying, no longer part of the perfect ideal. And then you come out and you're able to come back to the perfect platonic ideal. And this isn't, this is really a story. The story we've been talking about of the story of progression and growth and moving forward and becoming something. This is just some changing of states. Once we're in a state of perfection, then we're in a state of absolute gross sinful imperfection. Maybe you could get to the perfection again or just worse. The Bible is actually a completely different story. This is reading a story into what we're actually reading. This is reading the story backwards. We're trying to read it frontwards. Some of you may even have heard the classic theory that Jesus was just made up by the Roman Empire in order to encourage people to love their enemies, which was Rome, so that they don't retaliate against Rome. It's not that historically reliable. The Bible wasn't written in order to give people an idea of an ideal that they need to follow, and if they don't, then they'll get punished. And the Bible wasn't written as a story to get people manipulated by those in power, especially because the whole thing is a huge critique of those in power. So let's actually talk about what really is in the Bible. First, I'm going to give you the narrative. We're going to be big picture here and look at the narrative, the pattern that runs through this story. And then we're gonna get way more zoomed in and deep and go through an overview of all 66 books in the Bible. And then we'll talk about the books that didn't make it in the canonized Bible that we have. So let's do this. Okay, now let's zoom way out and talk about the narrative that runs through this entire biblical story. And to tell this story, we have to start in Egypt. Egypt, which is actually where the second book of the Bible starts out, Exodus. But I believe we have to start in Exodus, even though it's the second book of the Bible. Because I think Genesis, the first book, is actually better understood as a sort of prequel. Because the main story, as you read this whole thing, the foundation, the core, the thing that set off this entire thing happens in the Exodus. And it's constantly called back to and remembered and reminding the listeners of. And Genesis is kind of like the stories of the ancient fathers of the faith and how we got to Egypt. So let's start here. The story starts with this Israelite tribe enslaved in Egypt 
under Pharaoh for hundreds and hundreds of years, crying out to their God that they heard stories of all their lives from their parents and grandparents and ancestors, who a God of justice and faith, a God that's supposed to free them from this stuff, a God that's supposed to liberate them from this enslavement. Then one day, God hears the cry and God, through this character Moses, frees God's people. And through plenty of events that we can't really go into detail and read it yourself, through plagues and challenging Pharaoh between Moses and Pharaoh and a lot of drama and action, they're freed from Egypt and God sends them over to Sinai. Okay. Sinai is a mountain that we're not really sure where it is. There's a traditional site in Israel that you can go to that they say this is Mount Sinai, but it's not 100% confirmed that that's the typical one. It's a hill that God sends his people to and through Moses gives them a law. That's a classical image from the Bible of Moses holding up these two tablets. This is where the Ten Commandments come from. But actually, it's not just ten commands that God gives the Israelites. He actually gives them about 613 commands. And all these commands are about how they are to live now that they are free. Let me read this real quick. And this is when he brings them to Sinai and he says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. Okay, first off, priestly kingdom. Let's break that down. Priests were people who represented God to the rest of them. So he's saying, I'm calling all of you in this tribe to be my representatives. And then he says, a holy nation. Holy, really in ancient Hebrew, means to be set apart, separated, special. So I'm calling you guys to be a special set apart tribe to represent me in the world. And how are you gonna represent me? Let me give you these commands. And he gives them commands that will help them avoid ever being enslaved again and avoid ever becoming an empire themselves that enslave and oppress others. That's what all of it is. When Jesus is later asked, sum up the whole law, all of these commands in just a sentence or two, he says, okay, all of it summed up is love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these commands could be summed up with that. And plenty of these commands is also teaching them a new way to be human because as slaves, they need to learn a new way of living, no longer following someone else's orders gives them rules like take a Sabbath, take a day out of the week where you're not just working, where your value isn't just in what you do, but your value is in who you are, remembering that I rescued you from that life. And throughout the story, God keeps reminding the Israelites, remember, remember what I did. Remember where you came from. Remember those that oppressed you and become a way better nation than that. And as they keep going, they start to not remember. They look around at all the other nations with their gold, their riches, their women, and they wanna be like them. And then they even say, we want a king like them because God didn't want his nation to have a king because he saw how that could easily, easily get corrupted really fast. But they're like, please give us a king. Give us someone over us like all the other nations. God eventually obliges, gives them a king. First King Saul, 
then King David. King David was a really good king. And uh, then we have King Solomon. And this is when this little tribe of ancient Israelites becomes the kingdom of Jerusalem. And yet, as they're still worshiping this God, giving their life to this God, constantly making sacrifices to this God, they forget where they came from because of their desire to be like all the other nations. King Solomon builds a ginormous temple for God. But you know how he builds it? He builds this temple by using slaves. Slaves of their own people. This story starts off with God saying, I'm going to free you from slavery because this isn't how the world should work. And I'm going to give you a set of commands so that you become a nation way better than Egypt, a nation that blesses all the other nation, nations. And they end up becoming the same. King Solomon becomes the new Pharaoh in Jerusalem. And throughout the whole way, God had warned them again and again and again. If you do this, then I'm going to kick you out of the land that I gave you. I'm going to give you over to all these other nations that have been wanting to conquer you, but I haven't let them. And even through several reminders to the different kings that the reason you are in charge of this tribe, of this nation, is so that you can maintain justice and righteousness. Still don't listen. So God hands them over. And they get taken over by Babylon. Their kings are killed, humiliated, families' eyes gouged out in front of each other. They're enslaved, executed, humiliated, prostituted. Awful, awful things. And their situation is back to this whole thing. Back to being just like when they were in Egypt. Because they didn't take the calling seriously to be the nation that blesses all the other nations. They instead wanted to be like the other nations and became yet another empire that oppresses the poor and the low and the ones that they should have been helping the entire time, following their original intention of their existence. And the rest of the Old Testament is prophets being sent by God while they're in Babylon. First, even before they get sent to Babylon, God is sending prophets saying, watch out, be careful, remember who you are, return. Because the word that prophets often use is repent. Repent is the Hebrew teshuva, which means to return. Very different from how we may use the word repent today. We tend to use the word repent today as like, realize how wrong you are, repent. But this version of repentance was God sending prophets saying, return, return back to what I called you to be. And them not listening, being sent to Babylon, and then several other prophets being sent throughout the rest of this section of the Bible, saying things like, God, free us again, like they're saying when they're in Egypt. God, you are the God of our ancestors. You liberated us before. Now hear our cry again and liberate us again. Send us someone who's going to free us out of this mess the same way you sent Moses to get us out of here. And they're crying out for yet another figure like Moses, yet another savior, yet another liberator to come and rescue them from all that they're suffering through. And that's where we end the Old Testament. This figure is called the Messiah that they're praying and hoping for. The Jewish tradition still is waiting for a Messiah. The tradition says that when this figure comes, everything is going to be put back together as it should be. They felt like Jesus wasn't really that. But there is another tradition that felt like Jesus was. That Jesus was this messianic figure, this new Moses that was sent by God to free them once again. And that's where we get to our story, and the New Testament, which starts 
with them and Rome. Rome is basically the new Babylon. Rome is the biggest military superpower that the world has ever seen, bringing their reign of peace and prosperity. Augustus Caesar called the savior of the world and prince of peace. Why? Because he conquered and killed any enemies that would stand in his way. Because if all your enemies are dead, then there's peace, right? And in the midst of this, Jesus comes and he builds this movement predicated on the message of spreading the kingdom of God instead of the kingdom of Caesar. And this is why Jesus is killed. Jesus is killed as a political punishment because he's le leading a movement of people saying, we don't believe Caesar is Lord. We believe Jesus is Lord. And that's why Jesus and the rest of his immediate followers are put on a cross as a way of public humiliation unto death as a way of deterring anyone else who would even think of uprising in any sort of way against Caesar. Because this new movement was saying, yeah, Caesar isn't Lord Jesus is. Caesar isn't the savior of the world or the prince of peace or the son of God, all names given to Caesar first. Jesus actually is. And we believe that Jesus is actually making a better world, bringing a reign of peace and prosperity, not through conquering and killing everyone, but through sacrificial love and peace and nonviolence. And non Jesus comes and reminds them of who they were, as was told to them at Sinai. He reminds them, you have a special calling here. Don't forget it. You're called to be a nation that blesses all the other nations, a tribe that blesses all the other tribes, a family that blesses all the other families. And that is how you're gonna get out of this mess. Several of them didn't believe he was the Messiah because he didn't physically pull them out like Moses physically helped them out of Egypt. Because Jesus died, left, and people were like, uh, Rome is still in power. I guess that wasn't the Messiah. But instead he had a very different idea in mind, which was to remind them of who they are so they all together can become a messianic figure and rescue themselves out of oppression by remembering who they were and getting back on the path, returning back to their original calling of being a nation that blesses all the other nations. Let me read one more thing here from... First Peter. I lost it. Hold on. Sorry. Here we are. First Peter 2 9. This is in the New Testament. One of the first apostles sent out by Jesus telling the rest of the Christian church. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And you've received that mercy so that you could once again be this holy, set-apart nation that blesses all the others. And that's how we get a, this small tribe of Jews, now including a bunch of non-Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, everyone, starting this movement predicated on Jesus' message of the kingdom of God, which is to be a nation that blesses all the other nations by bringing a reign of peace through sacrificial love, remembering who they were and getting back, returning to the calling that they always had. And anyone who reads this thing should come away from it thinking, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this movement that its sole purpose is to bless everyone else. The church's main purpose, priority, goal should be to benefit it's non-members. That's, that's the tribe that God calls. A tribe that exists for the benefit of its non-members. Constantly finding ways to bless and serve the poor, the low, and those who have no one to belong to. True and righteous religion, as James says, pure righteous religion is to take care of the widows and the orphans. This is the story. Let's forget 
any other story that you may have heard that the Bible tells. This is the story we're talking about. And this is my favorite story, which is why we're doing this whole course. And this is a story that I want to share with you all. Now in the next course, we're going to get way more zoomed in here on each book and how it follows this pattern. But there's the big picture. Okay, we're gonna continue talking about this narrative that I was just talking about in the last lecture, but now I'm gonna show you where that narrative actually happens in all 66 books of the Bible. Let's of course start at the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First five books of the Bible, also called the Torah or the law, because this is where the law is given. Now, Genesis, like I said, is a lot of very folk tale -ish stories that talk about the fathers of the faith, how things got to be where they got to be. And you could tell very much that these are the primary oral tales that were told around the campfire adapted to specific audiences. Because in a lot of these stories, they reference certain lands or certain people groups that weren't named that until like a thousand years later. And so we could very much tell that this is a collection of oral tales put together for this. And the story starts, like we said, in Exodus. First half of Exodus is being freed from Egypt. Second half of Exodus is Sinai and a long list of commands and how to set up God's tabernacle in God's temple. And Leviticus gets into the ceremonial laws and the purity laws. It gives very distinct instructions of how to make sacrifices to this God at the tabernacle in the temple. And some of you may immediately be like, ugh, this is really weird and violent and ancient and otherworldly when I try to read Leviticus because it's a bunch of instructions of how to make animal sacrifices. But here's the thing. Like I said, there's this constant progression steps forward throughout the whole Bible and they have to learn little baby steps first before they could get to greater steps. And at this time, animal sacrifice was made by every surrounding religion in the East. And this was qu quite progressive and revolutionary to the Israelite tribe because before sacrifices, humans had no way of knowing where they stood with the gods. And so therefore, they would make sacrifice after sacrifice, trying to call out to the gods, hopefully that they would have a good crop, that they would have rain come down, that they would have the sun come out, that they would have a healthy family, a healthy birth, all those things. And in hopes that they would, they would continuously make sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. I'm talking about all the religions. And it got to the point where because they weren't sure if any of the sacrifices were working, they just try to make more and more extreme sacrifices to the point where they're even sacrificing their children in hopes that the gods will listen. But in Leviticus, this God says, you don't have to go all the way extreme. Consistent in multiple places in the Old Testament, he condemns child sacrifice because all the other nations around them were doing a lot of child sacrifice. And this, he says, Okay, take the animals, this specific animal, and this specific way, bulls, sheep, sometimes birds, and make this specific sacrifice and your conscience is clean. That is a huge step forward than making child sacrifices or being in ultimate confusion and not knowing if anything is working. And then over time, things shifted, temple got destroyed, even before the temple got destroyed, God says things like, I hate your festivals and your sacrifices because you're not doing it with a heart to a heart after me. You're doing it with a heart of just routine. Anyway, really weird and regressive to read Leviticus, but it was a proper step forward. Then numbers, they take a census and 
as God is taking them to a land that he promised them, the promised land, this, he's giving them this land so they could live off this land and be the nation that blesses all the other nations. They end up wandering for 40 years in the wilderness as they're trying to find this promised land. And in this story, it says God pretty much made them wander for 40 years because throughout the whole process, they were complaining and whining and saying things like, ah, it was better back when we were slaves in Egypt. And God is like, don't you remember how bad it was back there? And so because of all that complaining and disobedience, he lets them wander for 40 years. Deuteronomy, a little bit more wandering and also a repeating of a lot of the laws that was already said, just in a kind of different way. And then at the end, Moses, the one who freed them and has been leading them this whole time, dies. And then we get to the book of Joshua. Joshua is Moses' successor, and Moses doesn't get to take them to the promised land. Joshua does take them to the promised land. But then God says, we got to, in order to get this promised land, get rid of everyone that's already in it. This is the land of Canaan, a whole bunch of Canaanites here. And in order to take over this land, I need you to kill everyone else as all these other tribes are part of this very large land. This is one of the most difficult books to get through. But you have to remember the context that it was written. First off, let's just straight up say, um, it's wrong for a tribe to kill other nations in the name of their God. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's okay. And I know some conservative Christians may say things like, well, God told his people to kill other people in Joshua, so if God ever tells me to, then I'm going to do it. No, that's not a good way of saying things. That's a very flat, literal reading of the text and not a progressive reading of the evolving story of a becoming, evolving faith of these people. And in Joshua, we have a tribe of people who are surrounded by tribes who only understood the concept of if we're going to move into a land, we have to fight with and kill the other tribes. And if we win, it's because our God enabled it. And so you have to understand that this is a very ancient tribe with an ancient tribal mindset who only understood how certain things worked in certain ways. And therefore, of course, they're going to say, that God told them to conquer these lands. Personally, the God revealed in this whole thing, the God that Jesus talks about, I don't think would agree with that. But God allows three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back. A few steps back here as they inquired the land with war and killing and violence. Then we get to Judges after they've already retrieved a big chunk of the land, they get judges over their tribe, which is really just a leader. This, a judge was a leader put in place to maintain justice among the tribe of Israelites. And they continuously were making bad choices. Some judges were good, some judges were awful. Throughout the whole time, this ancient Israelite tribe had a hard time becoming this nation that blesses the other nations. And they kept disobeying. They kept living lives of violence and debauchery. And they slowly started losing all of the land that they had gotten. And then we get whoops, to Ruth. Ruth is in the middle of the aftermath, the terrible, violent aftermath of Judges, and these two widows find each other. I'm sorry, these two widows are already with each other, but they decide to stay with each other and go back to their original land. Ruth, one of the widows, the other one, Naomi, her mother-in-law, meets a man, marries that man, is able to stay within the Israelite tribe and this coupling will end up leading to King David, which is one of our later kings of Israel. Now, 1 Samuel, the judge now, is Samuel. 
And Samuel is a great, great leader. And even when, even though he's a great leader, all of the Israelites are still like, yeah, but we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. We don't just want a leader who maintains the justice here. We want like a legit king who goes out and conquers people and brings in wealth for us. And again and again, Samuel's like, no, that's not who we are. We're different from everyone else. We're set apart. Then again and again, they cry out for a king and eventually he's like, fine. So brings them a king named Saul. Saul ends up being a pretty bad idea. Like God said, kings would be. David comes in. And this whole section is from 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel to 1 Kings to 2 Kings is the kings that Israel ends up having. And kind of like with the judges, some are really good and maintain justice. Some are awful and use their power to commit terrible acts of violence. And pretty much show that God was right in this case. That I told you, if you would have kings, things would get corrupt really fast. And that's what ends up happening. And it ends with splitting of the Israelite kingdom of Israel and Judah, and then them being handed over to Babylon. First Chronicles and Second Chronicles is a retelling of these events, starting with the kings, not with Samuel, and telling these stories from a kind of a different perspective way later. And there's a bit of contradictions between them, but there is ultimately a different perspective that it brings to this story. And in the same way, ends with the Israelites being handed over to Babylon and held captive to Babylon because of all the corruption caused by the kings. Ezra and Nehemiah is set where Babylon has already taken over and they destroyed the temple that they were using. And now they're crying out to God and trying to figure out a way to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah ends up building the, rebuilding the wall around the city. Uh, didn't build a temple, but they got that done at least. Esther is a story of a plot to kill the Jews by the Persians. And the, pot, the plot is foiled. Things are okay. But, of course, the unfortunate part, if you read the whole... It's like a really happy story because, like, they, they foil the plot. But it's also in the context of all these other stories where, yeah, but Babylon still got them, unfortunately. Okay, now this next section right here is called Wisdom Literature. First, we started with Torah. The section I just went over is the history section of the Old Testament. Now, wisdom literature starts with Job. Job is a very interesting and sad story about a man named Job who is living a great life, very wealthy, very righteous in the eyes of God. Satan and God make a bet, basically, and Satan says, I bet you if you take away all of his blessings, he's just going to turn on you and curse you. God's like, all right, we'll see. Take away basically everything he loves. Job is in so much suffering. Doesn't turn away from God and cur or curse him, but is crying out to God, questioning absolutely everything. The worst suffering, way worse than he could ever imagine. And while he's in this state, his friends come and surround him and have different answers for maybe why he's in this. They all end up basically being wrong and the story ends with God coming and saying, uh, you're actually all wrong. There is no ultimate answer to this suffering. And Job says, wow, I've seen God and now I regret questioning all this because I realize that there's a lot of suffering and uncertainty in life. Very, very interesting. You should read it. Psalms is a collection of poems and songs written over um, quite a long time. A lot of them are attributed to King David, but some of them are in the time of King David where God is praying and singing to God, both giving worship to God and praise to God and saying how great God is and God, where are you? But there's also quite a bit of Psalms that are from the time where they're 
held captive in Babylon, crying out to God, saying, God, where are you? Even crying out to God for vengeance on Babylon. Very much shows the struggle through poems. Then we get to Proverbs. Proverbs is attributed to King Solomon, and King Solomon was known as the wisest king ever. And Proverbs is just a whole bunch of wisdom sayings. You will get a whole lot of wisdom from this. I was I once told a leader of mine, hey, I want to be like more wise. What should I do? He's like, just read Proverbs. I thought he was gonna like give me some steps. He was like, no, nah, just read Proverbs. Ecclesiastes next, also attributed to King Solomon. And this was written like late in his life for he saw that, man, everything is meaningless. That's the how this book starts out. Everything is meaningless, utterly meaningless. And able to see that so much of what we chase after and desire is ultimately like vapor. That word meaningless is the Hebrew word havel, which means more like vapor, smoke, here one second, gone the next. And all that really matters is being able to find a way to enjoy your work and your time and your life here to enjoy the food and those around you. Then we get to Song of Songs, also attributed to King Solomon. And this is a bunch of love poems. And they're quite interesting. This is ancient Israelite love poetry. Some of them are a bit um, maybe inappropriate for kids. I don't know. Read it yourself. Some also may think it's an allegory for the relationship between God and Israel or Christ and the church. Maybe it's not. Read it for yourself. Then we get to the prophets. People often also separate these between like main prophets and minor prophets, but uh, let's just put them all together because they all have the same message, which is, Israel, what have you done? Don't you remember what we were supposed to be? Return to what we were supposed to be, or else this is gonna keep happening to us again and again and again. Also crying out for another savior, another Moses, another liberation like they experienced in Egypt. Then we get to the gospels. This is the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And there isn't four necessarily different gospels. That's not necessarily the case, but four versions of the gospel. There's one gospel, there's one story of Jesus, but these are different versions. That's why in a lot of Bibles you'll see it's the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, gospel according to Luke, gospel according to John. Mark's was most likely written first. Mark's is very fast-paced, very action-packed, leaves out a lot of Jesus' traditional teachings and parables that we find in other, other stories, leaves out the birth, leaves out a bunch of stuff, even leaves out the resurrection. His, his gospel ends with uh, the woman come to an empty tomb, are super scared. A man there in there says, go tell everyone that Jesus isn't here. And they run away, too scared to say anything to anyone. End of Mark. Very interesting. Matthew is written with more of a Jewish audience in mind. He makes a lot of parallels to Moses, a lot of quotes from the Old Testament so that people can see him as kind of a new Moses-like figure. And Luke really is trying to shape the, the vision of Jesus like a new king, a new Caesar, a better Caesar. So he uses a lot of Greek and Roman imagery when he describes Jesus and the way that he's trying to adapt the story to his audience. John, written way later than the rest of them, these first three are actually called the synoptic gospels, synoptic meaning like similar. And John is really shows like the most powerful Jesus. This Jesus doesn't ever really suffer or cry or complain like some of the others where he's like complaining and crying out to God, like, please take this away from me. Now this John is like, this is why I'm here. And this Jesus is adapted to a community who wants to hear about a strong Jesus, who needs to hear about a strong Jesus while they're being persecuted by people who are killing them and torturing them for following Jesus. Then we get to Acts or Acts of the Apostles. This is 
the beginning of the stories of the apostles, the ones that Jesus sent out to spread this message of returning back to who we were called to be, being a nation that blesses the other nations, a tribe that blesses the other tribes, and to live a life of sacrificial love in the midst of Caesar's reign of peace through victory and conquering and killing and violence. Then, we got this. We got the letters of Paul. Paul is the main famous apostle that a lot of us remember. Paul felt his calling was to really spread this message of Jesus to all the non-Jews. He was a Jew, but he felt like this message is for everyone. And so I'm going to make it my goal to just find all non-Jews, which were called Gentiles, that would need to hear this message. And this, this message, this good news, this good news that God loves everyone and he's inviting everyone into this story. So the reason they're called Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, stuff like that is because Romans is written to the church in Rome. First and second Corinthians written to the church in Corinth. Those are really answering a lot of questions. We don't have the letters that they sent to Paul, but you could tell, especially in first Corinthians, he's responding to a lot of things that they're wondering or arguing about. Then uh, Galatians written to the church in Galatia. Ephesians written to the church in Ephesus. Philippians written to the church in Philippi. Colossians written to the church in Colossae. And first and second Thessalonians written to the church in Thessalonica. And then first Timothy, second Timothy and Titus are also written by Paul, but written to other pastors. Another pastor who he mentored named Timothy and another pastor who he mentored named Titus. And some people, some scholars believe that Paul didn't write these because of how, how the language is so very different and his message seems to be a little bit less radicalized. Like he's saying in a lot of these previous letters, hey, there is, all are one in Christ, no male nor female. There is no male nor female. There is no slave nor free. There is no Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ. And then you get to 1 Timothy and he's saying, uh, the woman shouldn't teach. It's like, what happened to the Paul that said there is no male or free, nor female and that we're all one in Christ? He also says in one of these that slaves should obey their master. But what happened to Paul saying that there, there is no slave nor free, that we're all one in Christ? So because of that, some scholars think that this was written by other people who were inspired by Paul and trying to just calm down this radical movement that was going on. But I think it's also possible that Paul was just in a different mind state years later, way later into his life. And he's also writing a personal letter instead of a communal letter like the other ones. And because there are more personal letters, when he says in First Timothy, I, don't not, I do not allow women to teach, he's very much saying, I do not allow those specific women in your specific church to teach because those specific women are spending each service yelling and acting like um, a fertility cult next door. Like, it doesn't say that directly, but a lot of the things that he says is very similar to a popular fertility cult at the time. And so he, so he's like, no, those, those aren't, you need it. Yeah, not them. And then we get to Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter. Oh yeah, Philemon by Paul too. But then Hebrews, we don't know who wrote that, but it's a letter to other Christians encouraging them. James, written by James, the brother of Jesus, who was the head of the church until he died, and written to other Christians, first and second Peter, and then first written by Peter, and then first, second, and third John, written by John, all apostles, to other Christians to encourage them. And then same with Jude, written to other Christians. And then the last book of the Bible is Revelation. That's a heavy one. Um, in America, American evangelical churches over the last couple of decades, there's been some churches that seem to only talk about Revelation, which is a lot about the end of times, the end, the end of days, the Antichrist, uh, all this, the rapture, all that stuff. First off, the rapture isn't in the Bible. That, that was invented like over the last 100 years at least. 
and at most, I mean, <laughs> and Revelation is interesting because it says it's written by John and he gets this vision and he sees all this magnificent stuff, beasts and animals and angels and trumpets and lights and heavens and hells and it's very, very much a vision that needs to be interpreted metaphorically, symbolically. And what I find the most interesting is that the Caesars of the time, the emperors, were also called beasts. And in Revelation, John talks about a beast or a sort of antichrist coming and leading people away from the way of Jesus. And I think with his original writing, its first readers wouldn't have thought, oh, wow, this is probably going to make a lot of sense 2,000 years from now. No, they would have read it and thought, wow, we see antichrists all around us. We see those in power trying to lead us away from the way of Jesus all around us all the time. And so it's encouraging people. There's going to be antichrists that try to lead you away from the way of Jesus, that try to make it more about empire and self-preservation but you need to remember who we are you need to stay true to the faith in these hard times of persecution and empire and ultimately it ends with the message that ultimately god will take the beasts all types of antichrists and he will bring justice and through that God will bring the ultimate cleanup of the world where those who love God will be with God. Those who disobeyed God will be thrown into a lake of fire. And that's how Revelation ends. It's kind of dark and scary, very much so. But ultimately, it's a vision. I don't think we should take it too literal. Personally, I don't believe in a literal hell um, because it seems like when we look at the entire story of the Bible, it's revealing a God who only punishes for the purpose of restoration, not for the purpose of just, I'm going to watch you eternally be tortured and fire for the rest of time. No, no, no. He only punishes for the purpose of restoration. Also, fire throughout multiple parts of the Bible is used for pruning and restoration. So it's possible that that's where they go with the lake of fire, but it's also possible that we need to remember it is symbolic. And I think the most important thing to realize when reading this whole thing is that the meaning is in the middle, not the end. Usually when we read a book, all the meaning gets summed up at the end. This book is very different. This book, the meaning is in the middle and the teachings and life of Jesus and what he calls people to live, which is him saying, I am calling, I'm calling you to live life and life to the fullest. And that type of life is returning to the way of love, loving God and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the story. That's the meaning of this whole thing. So that is the whole narrative through each book of the Bible. I know it's a lot. I know my writing is really sloppy, but here's a bit of an overview so that when you do open up the Bible, if you ever do, you kind of have a clue of where everything is instead of just this long list of ancient names that you don't understand. There you go. Okay, before we finish this section out, let's talk about the books that didn't make it, or what is often called the Apocrypha, which is comes from the Greek hidden. Let's talk about these books. Tobit, Judith, we got some additions to Esther, not a whole other Esther, but just some additions. Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes like we talked about in the last one, Ecclesiasticus. Baruch, Letter of Jeremiah, some additions to Daniel. 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees. Now you'll actually find all these books in the Catholic Bible, but not in the Protestant Bible. And the Protestant Bible is actually, nowadays, when you go to the store, it's going to be filled with a bunch of Protestant Bibles. Or you go to some Bible website and it lets you pick a, trans a long list of translations. Most of those are all going to be Protestant versions and then like one or two Catholic versions. And these books were all written 
not as a part of the Hebrew Bible, not collected by Jews to be a part of their canon, but they were written into the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And after the destruction of the temple, when Jews officially decided their canon, they decided to not include any of these books because these books were only written in Greek and they were written post Ezra. And they believed that all of their prophets had written from Moses to Ezra and then prophecy stopped. All these books were written after that from 300 BC to 70 AD. A lot of scholars also call this the intertestamental period, the time between where the Old Testament leaves off and the New Testament begins, which is around roughly 500 year period. So all this is written during that period in Greek. And as the Jews were like, okay, yeah, these are the Greek books written for a Greek version of our text. And we're trying to get back to our roots with the Hebrew Bible. So yeah, they're, they're, they're helpful, but we're not going to consider them the official canon. But with the Christian movement, since a big majority of them were Greeks, they used the Septuagint to be their Bible that they read, which included all this. Then around the fourth century, the... Uh, the theologian Jerome made his translation from the Septuagint to what's called the Vulgate, which is the Latin version. And as he was translating these, he knew that these were extra books, not a part of the initial Hebrew Bible, and he didn't want to include them, so he didn't. But then when it got in the hands of everyone else, they're like, oh, what about these? These are part of the Septuagint that we've been reading. So they put it back in. And later with the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, Martin Luther, as he's looking back at the Bible, noticed the same thing that Jerome did. But this time people listened in the Protestant Reformation because they're making the Bible the central, central highest authority. So they got rid of them. The Catholics call these the deuterocanonicals which Deutero means secondary. So they admit that it's not exactly aligned. It's not as canon as the rest of them, but they're still beneficial and helpful. I'm not going to really go into detail of what's all in this because we're really talking about the 66 books here and that main story. But it would be cool if you did your own research a little bit. And some of these stories are actually pretty interesting, pretty cool, and they show even more so of the Israelite culture at that time, especially during the intertestamental period. So we already talked about how we got the canon. These are the books that really, they're like, ah, no, got rid of. And the other books that weren't even considered ever a part of the Bible were like a bunch of other gospels or other gospel versions or other letters written by other church leaders to other churches, but of course they followed those four questions that we talked about earlier. Is it apostolic? Is it orthodox? Is it Catholic? Has it helped the churches over time? And the books that didn't make it, some of those answers were no. And I don't think that shows that the churches were trying to keep secrets, any hidden things. I think sometimes we hear the stories of the canonization and think that there's these secret books that they're trying to keep from people and that's why they didn't make it. No, it just didn't fit into the collection of books that they wanted to use for group identity at the time. A lot of these books you can find, sure, you could find a lot of these books that didn't make it. Just Google books, Bibles, books that didn't make it or Google Apocrypha or Google extra hidden lost gospels, whatever you want, you can find a bunch of them. They're pretty interesting because they show the diversity of thought, but that's it. They show the diversity of thought, not exactly the main storyline, the main canon that in the initial Jewish and Christian community agreed upon to let them walk in the path of. So here we go. That's the books that didn't make it. Not a big conspiracy. But I did want to mention this before we move on. There you go. Okay, we made it to the end of another section. Now we ask, now what? 
This one will be really simple. This one is the most, this section was the most information heavy. And so I really just want you to think about all this information and really just, if you have a Bible or if you're looking at the Bible online, just skim through these different books of the Bible. You can even Google some of the stuff that I said and do your own research a little bit. Go to the library, look at other books about these, these topics and really just go through these tables of contents, these different books, and think about the story that we've been telling. Yeah, just skim through it, flip through it. Try to look at this Bible, this biblical story, as the narrative we've been sharing, which is this tribe that God calls, frees from slavery, calls them to be a tribe that blesses all the other tribes, a critique of all the empires that are just after self-preservation, they don't listen, become a, an oppressive empire. God kicks them out, oppressed by Babylon, crying out for another savior, another liberator. Jesus comes and reminds them, remember who you were. Remember that you are to be a tribe that blesses all the other tribes. They say, okay. And then they get their, get their act together, following the way of Jesus to be this movement that is a holy priesthood, a set apart special group of people that represents God by living the way of love. That's the story. Don't let anybody tell you different. And really, as we keep going in these next sections, you're going to be able to come at this in your own way and try to find patterns in your own way. So keep watching. Welcome to section three, how to quit reading the Bible with Western eyes. That's kind of a theme that I've kind of hinted at subtly as we've been going, but we're really centering in now. We're really getting deep now because we first need to realize that all these major religions, the, all the major enduring religions, including Judaism and Christianity, which we're talking a lot about, come from the East. The only somewhat major religion that comes from the West is Scientology. Everything else, the East. And the East is very different from the West. Even more different from the West, the ancient East. Completely different way of thinking, of approaching life, each other, the world, and God. Completely different. And we need to understand that, I think, in order to more fully and deeply understand the Bible because we need to understand what was the culture and the ways that they went about things while they wrote this down. And something that's also very interesting is I think it's extremely helpful to get a more Easternized version of these characters, particularly Jesus. The Western Jesus is like white and blue eyes and blonde hair. That's not Jesus. He was a Jew, an Arab Jew living in the Middle East in the first century Palestine, which is the, his area he was in is now modern day Turkey. So this guy, very, very Eastern figure, even his behaviors and mannerisms, very Eastern. There's even a lot of stories of people who grew up Christian in America, got very tired of the whole thing, walked away from it, got very interested and involved in Buddhism and Siddhartha Gautama and all his, his Eastern Buddhist teachings, then came back to Christianity, seeing Jesus with the Eastern eyes they gained through Buddhism, and suddenly Jesus came alive to them in a whole new way. Yeah, and I think it's extremely helpful to do that. It's extremely helpful to let go of our Western eyes, our Western ways of seeing things, and try to get really deep here and see things how the people we're reading about saw things. So throughout this whole section, we're going to talk about, first of all, is the Bible true? And break that down and understand that truth and how we define truth was very different back then compared to now. And then next we're going to talk about how Americans often miss the actual politics of the Bible. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how the Bible is a conversation starter, not a conversation ender. 
And a lot of Westerners approach this thing to be a conversation ender, but that's not the case. So I'm extremely excited for this one. So let's get right into it. Okay, let's talk about, is the Bible true? When I say the word true, I mean capital T true. Capital T truth. We're talking about big truth here. Not they got their truth and they got theirs, but like the capital T, the capital T truth. Okay, now this is an interesting question because our understanding of truth, I would say, changed drastically after the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, okay? Let's break it down like this. Now I would say that when we talk about truth in our Western context, in our modern Western context, we're talking about the how of things. Our truth is, tell me how it exactly happened. Give me all the exact correct details and that is the truth of the story. But before that, how people told stories, truth was about the... the why. Now, let's, for example, talk about a popular story that's been told again and again and again. 9-11. When we tell the story of 9-11, it's all about the how, the details. We talk about two planes crashed in this tower at this time, this amount of people died, this amount of people were helping, this amount of people were involved in the terrorist attack. It's all about details, and we could get very caught up in the details and miss the big why, which is there's a lot of people on the other side of the world who have several reasons to not like us, historical reasons to not like us. And when we get too wrapped up in the how, the why kind of gets lost. But how ancient people told stories, it was all about the why. And they got a lot of the how wrong, a lot of the details mixed up all over the place wrong. Because like I said, these are oral tales that they would tell around a campfire that was adapted each time they told it. And so they all were aware that, of course, some of this is all over the place, not exactly how it might have exactly happened. But they knew it was ultimately about the why are things this way? And how, and any how was really of how am I going to live this out? Not how am I going to think about it differently, but any how was, how is life going to be different? And truth, as it changed with post-enlightenment, truth became with, came with the spread of the scientific method, which was it's only true if it could be scientifically, literally, historically, factually proven. That is truth. If it can't, then it is not truth. But here's the thing. I, I'm totally for the scientific revolution, technology, science, medicine. But that type of truth is only one type of truth. There are other types of truth. There really are. There are types of truth that can't be confined to literal truth. That's the type of truth that the Bible is written, a type of poetic, bigger, allegorical, metaphorical, symbolic truth that the Bible points to. And yet the church's response to the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution and the change of the definition of truth was, where, well, the Bible is true, so let's just say that everything in the Bible is that same type of truth, literal, historical, factual. And I think they butchered the Bible by trying to stuff it into that category of truth because the Bible doesn't work that way. The Bible doesn't play by those rules. The type of truth that the Bible talks about is not the type of truth that we find in textbooks. The type of truth we find in the Bible is the type of truth that we sing about. It's the type of truth that when somebody, someone asks about someone you love, you wind up going into several metaphors where it's like, this person, this person makes my heart feel alive. Was your heart like not alive before that? No, 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 no. They're talking symbolically, metaphorically, poetically because they're trying to get at 
certain emotions that are way beyond language, that can't fit in literal language, that you need to start getting into the metaphors in order to try your best to explain. It's the type of truth that we read and write poems about, that we sing and hear songs about. It's the type of truth that we know cannot be explained with literal words. It's the type of truth that anytime we try, we try to explain it, we feel kind of silly. We feel kind of out of it. Um, I remember one time I was in Mexico and I told this friend of mine that is, lived in Mexico about this girl that I really liked back home. And I was telling him just how great I think she is and how awesome it would be to be in a relationship with her. And he, his response was, oh, so she's like your media naranja, your media naranja. I was like, what? What is that? It's these Spanish words. I like, I, I, I knew naranja is orange, but and media is like half. But what are you talking about? And then he's like, you never heard that before? I was like, no. And I was, what does it mean? And he was like trying to figure out a way to say it. And then he finally was like, I get it like it means I, like literally it means half an orange, but it's I'm trying to say like your other half. He was like trying to translate this in a way that isn't just half an orange, but it was difficult because media naranja is a word that is used as a metaphor to describe someone that you feel is so deeply important and significant to you that. It's like your other half, your other half of the orange in a way. And of course, it's saying, it may sound silly and totally otherworldly, but certain cultures have their symbols and metaphors that mean a lot to them. And the Bible is filled with symbols and metaphors that mean a lot to them that are all trying to point to something beyond language. And to be confined to this is a literal story filled with literal truths and literal facts is, like I said, to just butcher the whole thing. To try to take a love song filled with poetry and metaphor and say, okay, yeah, but I don't think your heart was literally made to feel more alive. I don't think you missed her so much that you were literally in stitches. Therefore, discount the whole thing. No, 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 no. That's not how you approach this type of truth. Even the most ancient church fathers, the initial theologians, interpreters of scripture knew this. Let me read some quotes from the ancient church fathers. Augustine said, the Catholic faith I now realized could be maintained without presumption. This was especially true after I heard one or two parts of the Old Testament explained allegorically. Whereas before this, when I had interpreted them literally, they had killed me spiritually. He saw that there's a lot of the Bible that if you try to interpret it literally, is butchered. It kills you spiritually and you have to go deeper than that. Here's another one from Clement of Alexandria. It says, as we are clearly aware that the Savior teaches his people nothing in a merely human way, but everything by divine and mystical wisdom. We must not understand his words literally, but with due inquiry and intelligence, we must search out and master their hidden meaning. Like there's, there's a hidden meaning here. There's a deeper meaning here. This is coming from God. Why would it just be literal? Then here's another one from Origen of Alexandria. He said, the reason why all those we have mentioned hold false opinions and make impious or ignorant assertions about God appears to be nothing else but this. Like the reason all these people are totally wrong about God whenever they talk about God, this is why. That scripture is not understood in its spiritual sense, but is interpreted according to the bare letter. The reason all these Christians are confused and getting the whole story wrong is because they're interpreting, interpreting it literally. They're not seeking out the deeper, hidden, spiritual meaning here. This, this excites me. This was written like in the 100s, 200s, 300s. And this shows me that what we're talking about is way deeper. Origen even was under the impression that the Bible does come fully from God. He believed every word was from God. 
But because it's all from God, of course it has to be interpreted symbolically. Not literally. Humans would write literal stuff. If it's coming from a spiritual transcendent being or force or power that's pulling this whole thing forward, of course it's going to be way deeper than literal. And some of you may hear this and think, well, it's just an allegory. It's just a metaphor. It's just a story. It's just a poem. When really, I hear that and I hear people say, oh, it's all literal and think, oh, it's just literal? Because if it's just literal, then it only applies to that particular time, that particular place, to that particular community. But if it's deeper than literal, if it's spiritual, if it's symbolic, then it can apply to anyone, anywhere. And maybe some of these stories are literally true, factually true, historically true, but there's no way of us knowing. You could believe the whole thing is literally true, that doesn't matter. But primarily you have to read it for what it is, which is an attempt to tell stories and poems and letters pointing at a truth beyond words through metaphor and symbols. And the Bible mixes poetry, history, story, and it mixes it in a way that we can't break it apart. We can't really look at a story and say, okay, that part was probably true or accurate. That part was probably added in. That part was probably just a metaphor. It's so mixed in. It's like a cake. The person who makes the cake puts in all the ingredients in all of their own specific ways. Then we eat the cake. We could kind of taste, oh, I, I kind of taste that part, I kind of taste that part, but you have no idea how much of each ingredient is in that cake by the time it's a cake. That's how a lot of these Bible stories are, mixing a lot of things that you can't really break apart because that is how they told stories. Another, um, one of my favorite stories of the Bible that really brings this example to light is the whole story of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, it takes place during the time where the Israelites were held captive by Babylon. And Daniel and his friends are enslaved and they become the personal slaves inside of the king's place, King Neber, Nebuchadnezzar. There we go. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And they choose to not follow his ways. They choose to keep a strict vegetarian diet so that they stay eating kosher according to their purity laws. They choose to not bow down to the king's statue. They choose to keep their faith. But here's what's interesting. This story, most scholars agree, was written around 200 BC, which was hundreds of years after this story in Babylon. And by this time, they were no longer oppressed by Babylon. They were oppressed by a different empire right before Rome. And as they're writing this, as they're telling this story, you can see them thinking back to when they're oppressed by Babylon, telling this story of, you know what, we've been through this before. And some of us kept our faith through the whole thing. We kept our Jewish faith. We kept in line with our values the whole way through, and we can do it again. And then they take this story, these historical events that they all know, which were the historical events of the Babylonian Empire, and they place in this Jewish character in order to give a whole new perspective of this story. Because there are certain events in the book of Daniel that we do know historically happened, like it, there's mentions of certain kingdoms rising and falling, even a certain period of time where Nebuchadnezzar kind of disappeared. And Daniel is placed into these historical events kind of sloppily in a way to make it seem like he had something to do with each and every event, that something he did or said made these events happen very similar to how Forrest Gump is placed into historical events in the movie Forrest Gump. It's a story, but they place his character in through these random historical events, and it turns out he had something to do with it. 
but it's ultimately telling a bigger story. And the purpose of Daniel, as it's mixing in history and symbolism and metaphor and poetry, it's to able to adapt and encourage the Israelite tribe who's now in captive by another empire. Keep the faith. Keep the tradition. We've done it before. We can do it again. To read the book of Daniel and just say, oh, wow, that was an interesting historical event is missing the whole point. You have to read it deeper than that. Because this type of truth we're talking about isn't literal truth. It's a type of truth, like I said, that we sing about, that we struggle to put words to, that actually pushes us forward into greater and greater growth and love and progress. That's the type of book that we're dealing with. Like we've been saying, this is a story written from and for this oppressed tribe of Israelites stuck under the boot of empire after empire. The Egyptians, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Romans, one after the other, underneath them. And that's important to realize that we're reading about this story from the side of the losers because usually history is told by the winners but this whole story the whole way through is told from the story of the losers of the victims of this story which makes it very very different from anything else we might read and i think it's extremely important as we approach this text to realize as Americans, we are reading this text from yet another global military superpower about plenty of other global military superpowers like Egypt or Rome. And Israel was the victim in these stories. And so it may be a little bit hard to understand some of the themes about a tribe who's critiquing empire when and we're in an empire itself. And the whole way through, it's when it's not critiquing empire, it's talking about how to be a different kind of nation, way different than the empire's goal to just self-preserve over everything. I mean, this idea of the empire that let self-preservation cloud every other value and goal very much reminds me of America first and that whole ideology. America first is nowhere near the whole idea of a nation that exists to bless all the other nations, a tribe to bless all the other tribes. Hmm. And this story, all of these books in this Bible has lasted so long. It's lasted longer than any other empire because it is never on the side of any empire. It's on the side of the victims of empire again and again and again. And there's about 2,000 verses, more than 2,000 verses that talk about poverty and serving the poor. I mean, we talked about the mission and goal and calling of the Israelite tribe to maintain justice and righteousness. So there's all those verses, but same in the New Testament, where James, like I've been quoting again and again, where he says that pure religion is to take care of the widows and the orphans. And there's plenty of other verses the whole way through. Jesus, when he talks about the people that he judges and who he's going to see as righteous and who he's going to see as unrighteous. The ones that he chooses as his followers, that he sees as righteous at judgment, that he judges as his people, are the people who he says fed the hungry, gave water to the thirsty, and clothed the naked. Those are his people that he's looking for, not the people that believed all the right things. And speaking of these 2,000 verses, uh, recently the President Donald Trump put in a bill, a new tax bill, that significantly lowered the taxes that have to be paid by large corporations and plenty of rich people. And in response, plenty of ministers and pastors and leaders got together and went to the Senate when it hadn't passed just yet and read aloud some of these 2,000 verses. 
just read it and read it and read it, repeated and prayed and recited together these verses about poverty and serving the poor to show that uh, if you're saying that you're a Christian and you're trying to serve a nation with Christian values, pay attention to what this book actually says. Pay attention to the actual story revealed through this whole thing. There's a verse in the Psalms that says, some trust in chariots, but we, we trust in the name of the Lord. And that equation, America is the one that trusts in chariots. Chariots were the tanks of ancient times, basically. And when that happens, it, become, it may become a little bit difficult for us to understand the major themes of this book that we're reading. It becomes a whole other strategy that we have to take when we approach this text. Let me read you a passage from Luke 5, where Jesus says, he looks up at his disciples and says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what the ancestors did to the prophets. Now when we read this, it could be kind of heartwarming. But we have to realize this is a very specific message to a particular group. He's speaking to the poor, the hungry, and the grieving. And then he says, but woe, like woe, like giving a dark warning. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. And that equation, most of us in free, well-off America, most of you who are able to watch this right now, are probably part of the category that Jesus turns to and then says, but woe to you. Woe to you who do have it all together, who do have everything you need, who are are already full. But blessed are the poor, the hungry, those in need. Those are the people that I'm trying to aim for. Those are the people that I'm on the side of. And therefore, anyone on this other side that Jesus says his woes to must turn to Jesus and be about what Jesus is about, which is serving the poor. Being here for the existence of the benefit of the non-members of your tribe, not just for yours. So there's a little bit of extra steps that I think Americans have to take when they read the Bible. To read it and realize a lot of this stuff is for people who had it way worse off than I ever have and ever will. And it's also very many times critiquing the people in power, critiquing the people who are well off. And I don't think that should depress anybody. I think that should just remind us that we need to love what Jesus loved and love who Jesus loved and serve who Jesus served. I think that's the message of the Bible, definitely. And I think if we can approach the Bible like that, if we can approach the Bible slower, more attentively to the context, then this Bible will enliven you in a completely different way. Even if you don't believe that Jesus was holy and sent from God, even if you don't believe in any God at all, ultimately, this is a story that has 2,000 verses about poverty and serving the poor and a story about a nation that blesses all the other nations. And that is a story that can inspire so much that our world needs right now. So in this lecture, we're talking about how the Bible is a conversation starter, not a conversation ender. 
And I think one of the many reasons people step away from the Bible or maybe cringe a bit when people bring up the Bible is because of the people that they've met that treat it like a conversation ender, where you bring up something, whether it's a question or a problem and just something you're thinking about, and they bring out the Bible, tell you what it says as a way of kind of just shutting the conversation down. Like, let me tell you what the Bible says. Got it? Over. But actually, the Bible doesn't really work like that, because we often, as Westerners, want to approach this book as like an encyclopedia, as something that's going to give us the final answer, or even like Google. Like, we wonder something, look it up real quick, there's the answer, okay, I'm good. But actually, the way the Bible actually works is it actually draws us to have even more wonder. It actually draws us to have way, way more questions as we get deeper and deeper into it. Not more and more questions so that you could have all the answers in another part of the Bible, but more and more questions that you live out and discuss. The Bible, if read this way, should turn up your curiosity not shut it down. There's this story that I really love about two rabbis, old story, arguing about the meaning of a particular scripture, going back and forth. They've been doing this. This definitely isn't the first time. Always arguing about the meaning of this particular scripture, yelling at each other, getting angry, getting vicious. And in this story, it says God sees these rabbis and is just so annoyed listening to them argue about the meaning of this verse all the time. God comes down, appears before them, and says, you guys have been arguing and arguing about the meaning of this verse, so I'm just going to tell you what this verse means, the actual meaning. And the rabbis immediately get frustrated and say, who are you to come down here and try to tell us? Don't come down and try to tell us what you think the actual meaning is. Leave, Get out of here and let us argue about it. Because that's actually more of what the rabbinic Judaism culture actually is like, where it's not about finding the final answer, the correct singular interpretation, but it's about a discussion. It's about constantly questioning, reading these things aloud together, and then going at it at what it means. There is this text called the Talmud, which was which is called the Oral Torah, which after the temple was destroyed and the Torah the text became a more central part of Jewish spirituality, one of the other things they did was took all the teachings of the current rabbis and put them into writing so that they could keep that tradition. And a lot of those writings are pretty much they'll come upon a verse and say, this rabbi thinks that or says that this verse means this. This rabbi disagrees with him in this way. This rabbi disagrees with both of them in this way. This rabbi thinks this one's right about this part, but this one's wrong about that part. And this rabbi has a whole other interpretation of this verse. And then it just leaves it there and goes on to the next verse. It doesn't say, but this one was correct. Instead, it invites us into this debate. It invites us and lets us hear all these different interpretations and this debate and this wrestling and struggling with the text. There's this uh, line from Karen Armstrong's book about the Bible that I love where she's talking about this culture. And she says, the rabbis liked to point out that King Solomon used 3,000 parables to illustrate every single verse of the Torah and could give 1,005 interpretations of each parable which meant that there were 3,015,000 possible expositions of each unit of scripture. Yeah, that's just mind-blowing to me because that means that this process of reading this book and discussing this book and living out this book is an endless process of adapting and reinterpreting. And as we read it, we're invited to be engaged in this long, heated, and beautiful debate. And as we read it, we should come away with more questions. There's plenty of spiritual teachers, more so in Judaism than in Christianity, who teach people to read the Bible by saying, let's read through this story. Now I want you to write a bunch of questions. There is uh, this author I like named Kent Dobson that talks about him being in a class. And the rabbi, who is also a professor leading the class, says, read the story of Abraham sacrificing his son, and then right before he was going to sacrifice his son, 
an angel comes down, stops it, and God says, no, don't sacrifice him. Here's an animal. Very strange, interesting story found in Genesis. The rabbi says, read this story and then come back with a long list of as many questions as you have. Every student came back with their list of questions, feeling like they, they had a whole bunch. And then his response was, wow, this is it? This is all the questions that you have after reading this crazy story? You guys are lucky. I have way more questions than all of you combined, basically. And I think we need to be able to feel okay with asking questions. Unfortunately, a lot of spiritual contexts that preach this Bible and read this Bible together are very against questions. Or they encourage questions just so that the leader could give them the answer. And sometimes there are answers. But also, we need to be encouraged to always ask questions, always struggle with this text, wrestle with this text, consistently engage in this re endless reinterpretation and adaptation, and to let the text live through that struggle and that discussion. And you see this all throughout the Bible as well. There's a whole book of the Bible in the Old Testament called Lamentations, which the whole book is poems by people crying out to God, being held captive in Bab Babylon, crying out to God saying, where are you? It feels like you're a monster, that this is how much you've abandoned us. And then at one point in the middle, one person says, but we still have hope that you're gonna save us, that you're gonna get, this out of, get us out of here. And then it ends with, this is really hard. We want justice, we want vengeance, we want you to save us. And we believe you will, unless you are angry with us still. And it ends that way. It's a heavy book. The whole book is basically putting God on trial and saying like, how could you? How could you do this to us? In fact, even the original Hebrew name for the book, Hebrew names for these books are usually the first word of the book. And the first word is um, echo, which translates to how. So... This book in the Bible was a book in the Bible titled How, because the whole book is them crying out to God, how, how could you let this happen? This is awful. And also you heard me bring up Job earlier in the other lecture. Job, the whole thing is chapter after chapter after chapter of debate between Job and his friends, asking questions, arguing, discussing, together trying to figure out how could this happen why did this happen and then at the end when the god character comes in god doesn't say all right let me give you all the answers he comes at them with god's own questions and god says where were you guys when i laid the foundations of the earth where were you when i created this part of the universe where were you when i created this creatures in the universe where were you when i did this and i did that and did this and did that and then he says, brace yourself like a man, answer me. And Job says, wow, I've, I've heard God, but now my eyes have seen God. He didn't see God, he heard a voice. But by this God character questioning him and getting him to look at everything around him, somehow it settled it for him. He didn't give him any answers. He just asked some better questions than they are able to come up with. That's powerful. I, I think if the whole text itself reveals a spirituality of questions, multiple stories of people arguing back and forth with God, struggling and wrestling with this God, we should follow the trajectory. And like I said, what makes the relationship with God and people from the perspective of this Bible is the struggle and the relationship, is the consistent contending. And the same goes for this book and our relationship with this book. What keeps this book alive in our lives is the constant struggle with it, questioning, asking, discussing. Because it's also best to discuss and read this with a group of people. Because you get to wrestle with it together. And I think that's exciting. And so 
I think when we can approach this book, not as an encyclopedia or like Google trying to find the final answers, but as something that can spark our curiosity instead of shutting it down, this whole thing becomes something way deeper, way bigger, and way more miraculous. And that's one of the many reasons I love it. So my hope with these lectures in this section was to really widen up your perspective a bit. And I hope I helped did that. But I also want you to do some of your own practice to help you widen up your perspective a bit. Because I don't want to just tell you all the ways you should read the Bible. I'm just trying to give you tools to start seeing some of these patterns for yourself. So first practice I want you guys to do is to read one or more of these passages, but read them from the perspective of the empire, those in power. And then also try to read them from the perspective of the victim, the powerless. It's a lot easier to read it from the victim because it's written by the victim, but the most important one is, like I said, to try to read it from the perspective of the oppressor, the empire. Not so that you can feel like an oppressor or anything, but just so that you get a different perspective and start to see what this book is actually about, who is it written by and who is it for. I think that can help. And then the other thing, the other practice that I want you guys to do is to read one or more of these passages and write out a list of as many questions as you can. Go crazy with it. And it could be basic questions like, why would they call that that? Or why would this person decide to say that when he could have done this? Or it can be way bigger, deeper, existential of how could this story last? How could, if there is a God, how could this God do things this way? Go crazy with it. And I want you to think over those questions. Maybe some of them, as you read and contemplate on it, you can come up with some answers. Don't feel like you need to come up with answers. And ultimately, my hope is that you can read this, come up with some questions, and find someone you trust to just discuss it, talk about it. Not so that they make sure that they know this isn't for you to give them the answers to it, but just discuss these questions and just kind of let it mull over within your heart and mind and see how these can apply to your life. So hopefully so far I'm giving you some good, some good tools. This next section I'm going to give you even more tools. So let's keep doing it. Welcome to the fourth and last section, how to read the Bible. Some of the last section might have felt like that, but really we're going to give you some more particular in-depth tools. I mean, I feel like the last section was kind of giving you the mindset of how to come at the Bible. This one is how to actually read it and ways to approach it passage by passage by passage. And so the first lecture we're going to talk about reading it mythopoetically, which is a term I stole from Kent Dobson, and really about reading it deeper at a much deeper level. And then we're going to talk about letting the Bible criticize you for a change, because it's easy to criticize the Bible, and so many of us do it all the time. But the Bible, one of its biggest purposes is to get deep into your heart and encourage you to live a little bit differently, critique a little bit of your values. And then lastly, we're going to talk about a method of reading that's a lot less stressful called divine reading, ancient, ancient method of reading and interpreting the text. So let's get right into it. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to read the scriptures at a much deeper level. Earlier, I talked about a lot of church fathers who talked about how a literal reading of the text either doesn't get the full meaning or it could kind of spiritually kill you, as Augustine said. But we're going to talk about a deeper meaning because that's another way of reading it. They said you need to read it spiritually or allegorically. Origen, who is very much about helping people read it allegorically, tended to view three levels of biblical interpretation. The first level being the flesh, second being the soul, third being the spirit. The flesh level was the literal 
or historical meaning, just a straight, detailed surface facts. The soul level was the moral meaning, what, what in this text can give you new ways of living or what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. Spirit level is the allegorical or the spiritual meaning, the meaning that you have to dive deeper into and contemplate on and meditate on. And for Origen, there was no way the Bible was just literal, like I said earlier, because God was behind it, according to Origen's perspective. So of course the thing had to be interpreted spiritually or allegorically. And by approaching it this way, once again, like I've said before, we no longer have the burden of literal truth. We are no longer approaching it as a textbook. We're approaching this for what it is, a book filled with stories and poems and letters speaking to the truth, the type of truth that we sing about, that we write poems about, that is talking about the big things in the universe that matter. Yeah, this is deep, deep stuff, so we have to approach it that way. And there is also a common Jewish way of interpreting the scripture that also had levels. I want to go through a few different ways that people set levels to this thing. The, an old Jewish method of interpretation, same thing, started with the surface, which was Peshat. It was Peshat, Remez, Darash, Sod. Peshat was the surface level. Remez was the hints. What, what is this hinting at? What is this referencing to, whether it's in culture or other parts of the text? The third level in Darash means to inquire, which is basically what we were talking about earlier, to ask questions and discuss. And then the fourth level is Sod, which means secret, which is the type of truth that's come, that's approached by contemplating and meditating on it. And all of this leading to Kent Dobson's three levels that he talked about in his podcast, Kent Dobson, where he says... The Kent, his three levels of biblical reading is, one, what does it say? This is pretty much what we're talking about, like the literal surface meaning. What, what is the words here? What are they saying? What is it talking about? Second level for Kent is context. What is, the, what is it pointing to? Kind of similar to the hints. Like what is the historical context? What is the cult cultural context? What, is, what are the other stories that it's referencing within this story? And then the third level for Kent Dobson is the mythopoetic level. Let's break down that word. Mytho, coming from the word mythos, which the word myth, let's not think of that word in the sense of fake. The word myth is an overarching narrative, overarching narrative that a group of people walk into and use to decide the way that they live in the world together. That's a myth. Sometimes they're historically true, sometimes they're not. That's actually not the point when it comes to myths. And poetic is the like we've been talking about, the type of truth that's about things that are beyond language. So mythopoetic reading is to be able to dig deeper, see the metaphors, contemplate and meditate, let these things work on you and start to discuss and think for yourself, what is this pointing to? Because all religious texts are filled with all, sorry, let me repeat that, all language when it comes to religion. All religious language is metaphor. Every religion, every sacred text is all pointing to something else. It's like a, the old Buddhist teaching of a finger pointing to the moon. Realize this teaching is just a finger pointing to the moon, not the moon itself. This is all our best attempts with symbols and metaphors to point to something beyond language. And so to read it at that level, it requires deeply looking at, into it, contemplating, meditating, and trying to get at the spiritual level. But I do think it requires going through those steps because it could be a little difficult if you just go straight for the spiritual. So it should require looking what does it say? Then thinking about the context and then trying to get to the spiritual meaning. And a common Christian teaching is that the spirit, if you believe in the spirit, is that the spirit helps us interpret. The spirit helps us figure out the meaning and the application of the text. 
I believe in the spirit. I believe that could happen. If you don't, then I think you could still contemplate and meditate and discuss with your family and friends. What does this mean? What do you guys think it means? I read this story and it caught my attention and it made me think of this and this. And I was wondering what you guys thought of. That's a part of being a part of a community that reads the Bible. Being able to discuss, wrestle, and seek the spiritual meaning together. So we're going to keep going with this and I'm going to give you some more methods of approaching this. Okay, so now we're going to talk about letting the Bible criticize you for a change. Because we're always criticizing the Bible. We're always finding something wrong with the Bible, critiquing it in every way we can. But the Bible also does a great job at critiquing us, telling stories that call us into question. And in fact, the Bible is always even calling itself into question. The As we went through the whole narrative in each part of the Bible, we talked about how there was the law, and there was the wisdom literature, there was the prophets... The entire prophets section is very interesting after reading the law section. The law is like, I saved you guys. This is the type of nation I'm calling you to be. You're my special holy nation. The whole prophets are like, you guys do a terrible job at being my people. What is up with this? The, the Bible is the only sacred text that includes the critique of its own tradition, of its own tribe. Any critique that you could come at this tradition is already in it. They already included it. And honestly, I think being able to critique your stories and your positions and your beliefs and values deconstructed a bit is an extremely important part of growing, which is why I find it phenomenal that this book includes it in that that's actually part of it. It belongs. The deconstruction, the critiquing, the questioning is just as spiritually valuable as the learning and the growing and learning how to be more loving and righteous. And I love even one of my favorite examples is the story of Jonah. Jonah is one of the books in the prophet section. And Jonah is a satirical story that ends with God questioning Jonah, but also God questioning us, the ones reading the story. Honestly, Jonah probably isn't a historical account, a factual story. It very much comes off as a story that you would hear around a, ca a campfire. It very much comes off as very similar structure to like a parable of Jesus. Let me tell the story a little bit. Jonah is called by God to go to Nineveh, which is one of the um, one of the cities of Babylon, and he says, "Go to them and tell them to repent." And naturally, Jonah says, "No." He runs away, and I'm sure its first readers, the Israelite tribe, would be like, "Of course, he should run away. Babylon is the one who's been oppressing us and killing us and holding us captive, and all of our ancestors too." So it makes sense that he would run away. It's almost like God telling you to go to ISIS and tell them to repent. It's kind of a huge deal. He runs away. He ends up on a ship with some other men trying to just go the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. God makes a storm happen in the story. And the guys are looking around scared. Like, what? Are, why, how did we make the gods angry that there's a storm here? Oh, and then they figure out it's Jonah, this guy, that is making whatever angry. And they kick Jonah off the ship. Jonah is then swallowed up by a giant fish. Spends three days in this fish contemplating everything. Thinking over the calling that God has given him. Then Jonah is spat out onto the shore. And then, and okay, I believe in God. I believe God can do, God had some part to play in all of this universe. So maybe a guy can survive in a whale for three days, but that's not the point of this story. This is a story. Anyway, he spat out, goes to Nineveh reluctantly, repent, tells all the Ninevites, Repent. God sees you. God knows everything you're doing, and God wants you to live a life of justice and righteousness. And they actually listen. 
totally not what Jonah thought was going to happen. And they repent. They put sackcloth on their heads, which is a form of grieving. They put, so they're grieving for the way that they disobeyed God. And even the animals put sackcloth on themselves, which is another one of those comical um, parts of the story that make you realize it's a story. And then Jonah is just so bummed out. He's on a cliff and he ends up under the shadow of a tree and is just depressed because he wanted to see vengeance. He wanted to see justice. He wanted to see God take these people out. He wanted to go to Nineveh, if anything, have them say, no, screw off, and then God smite them all because of how many of his own people that he saw Nineveh smite. And God sees Jonah and says, like, basically, like, what's your problem? Should I, I have mercy and favor on you. Should I not also have mercy on these people and also many animals? And that is how the story ends. It doesn't then happen where Jonah says, oh, you know, God, you're right. I should be more merciful. No, no, no. It just ends with, should I not have mercy on them too? And I imagine its first readers would have heard that, like I said, asking Jonah and asking us. This whole story, they're cheering Jonah on like, yeah, run away from those Ninevites. Those people are awful. And then it flips and it's like, actually, God loves them too. That's heavy. That's a cut to the heart where they're like, whoa. I have to think about that one for a long time. And that goes with any of the people that we wish harm on when we apply that story to our lives. It ends with God saying, should I not have mercy on them too, since I have mercy on you? And another similar story is uh, the, the parable of the prodigal son told by Jesus. It tells many parables, many stories like this that's designed to call you to question and get you to think and challenge yourself. And in this story, there's a father who has two sons. One of the sons asks for his inheritance early, which is very harsh to do. It's basically saying, I wish you were dead. Asks for his inheritance early, goes away from the family, goes away from the property, and just spends it all on partying and drunkenness and debauchery to the point where he's hit rock bottom and he decides to come back and he feels like so ashamed that he plans this speech he's going to tell his father and is thinking maybe I could tell him that I'll come back as a servant because he definitely won't welcome me back as a son after everything I did and he comes back and his father sees him standing in the distance and the father runs after him and embraces him. And before he could say his planned speech, he says, hurry, come on. And he puts a robe on him, puts a ring on him and immediately throws the town wide party for him because he's so happy that his son has returned. The other son comes and sees that there's a party going on for his brother who ditched us. And he goes to his father and says, what's, what's this? You never threw a party for me or my friends. You never put out food for me or had any sort of celebration for me. And yet this son who ran away and betrayed us and totally dissed us, you're throwing a party for? And the father says, look, my son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. And everything I have has always been yours. And that's the end. It doesn't, we don't get the next scene of the son saying, oh, you're right, dad. No, 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 it ends like that because it's designed to get its original listeners to think, oh, I've felt that. There's been times where I was the prodigal son who ran away from everything. There's been times where I've been the jealous brother there's been times where I've been the father needing to welcome back someone who betrayed me. This, this is what the stories are designed to do, to cut to the heart and get you to start thinking and realizing, whoa, that really challenges me. And that is how you read the Bible and let it critique you and criticize you and challenge you for a change. And by reading this this way, 
I think it could lead to a way more healthy way of reading the Bible and approaching life and a way more wise way of reading this thing. And it definitely helps with spiritual growth and maturity when you're able to be open to being challenged and critiqued because it means you're open for growth. And ultimately, this book is trying to get you to engage with these stories so that you grow. So for this last lecture in this section, we're going to go through a very ancient method of approaching the scripture called Lectio Divina, which is a Latin term that means divine reading or even sacred reading. Let's go with sacred reading for this one. And we even did a whole course for free on sacred reading, just on sacred reading, where we get way more in depth. So go check out the other courses if you want to get into that. I love doing it. And I love doing this method of reading the scripture because this method is less about getting intellectual knowledge and more about feeling the divine, feeling sacredness, experiencing something within your heart as you dive deep into the text. And there's four levels of this, four steps. And even though we have steps to this method of reading, don't look at it as like a systematic and formal way of reading, but more of a peaceful and leisurely way. So let's first off saying that it's very peaceful, very leisurely, very much for the purpose of your own personal experience. It started way, way back in at least the third or fourth centuries with Benedictine monks. These monks were under the rule of Saint Benedict of Nursia, and Benedict was awesome. He saw all of the ways that Christianity had become suddenly commercialized under Constantine, the emperor, who had suddenly become a Christian. And he's like, oh, I feel like we've lost the plot a little bit here. Went out into the desert, started all of what we know now is the monastic order. Monks, nuns, monasteries, all started back then, kind of in reaction to the new commercialized Christianity. And one of the things that they did, as well as working and praying and serving, was reading the scripture in a pray prayerful manner or a meditative manner. And so they would go through these four steps. And this has continued throughout the times, becoming more and more popular ever since, even outside the monasteries now. First step is lectio, or read. This is where you just go through the passage and you could make the passage as long as you want. It could be just a chapter. It could be just a paragraph. It could be just a specific story. Don't be too systematic with it. This is purely for yourself. So go through the passage, read it very slowly. And some even suggest you read it slowly and out loud to yourself during the first reading. So go through it slowly, gradually, out loud, getting a sense of what is happening because the first question we're asking at this first step is, what does it say? Then go through it again, just quietly to yourself. Try to imagine you're actually even there. Next step, we got, um, sorry, meditatio, which is meditate. And at this point, the question you're asking isn't just what does it say? Now you're asking, what does it say to me? So going through the text, going through the passage, try to pick out a certain word or phrase or sentence that really sticks out to you, that really speaks to you. Maybe it's something that sounds out of nowhere, random, weird, absurd to find in the Bible. Or maybe it's something that reminds you of something else. Just something that strikes your heart immediately. Go for that and meditate on it. Ask, what is this saying to me? What is this saying to my life and my story and my experience of God? Third step is oratio, Latin for prayer, to pray. Now, the third question we're asking is, what do I have to say to God about this? And you go through this meditating on the certain phrase or sentence or word or image that you 
had been meditating on and you start to think, how can I live this out? How can I seek God's help for this to be a part of my life? Maybe it's something that you feel like you need more of in your life. Maybe it's something that reminds you of a disappointment or tragedy in your life and you're trying to overcome it or get through it. And you can choose any type of prayer at this point. It could be just simply asking God for something. It could be telling God, kind of lamenting and a bit of grieving toward God. Like, why is it this way? Why would things be this way? Why am I encountering this truth? It could just be a bunch of questions or it could be just a bunch of statements. But this is the part where you actually pray. All the other steps, you're just listening. This part, you're actually given something. Then, fourth step is contemplatio, Latin for contemplate. And at this point, you're asking, how does, what difference in my life will this text make? How will my life be different because of what I've just meditated on? And this point, you just sit in absolute silence and peace. If it's difficult to be in silence, maybe you're like moving around, just focus on your breath coming in and out of your nose or out of your mouth, just observing the breath, not trying to change it, just observing. Or you could deepen your breath if you're feeling a little antsy and just sit there, rest with it. Let it mold over in your brain. Let it do its work within your heart. And that could be for 20 minutes or that could be for a few minutes or just make, let it be as long as you need it to be. And then when you come away from this reading of scripture, you notice it is a way less stressful way of approaching scripture than maybe you have before. Because sometimes we approach it and we're just like confused or we could suddenly try to just talk and talk and talk about it, think and think and think about it. But this is trying to feel around it, trying to experience something within your heart as you approach the text. And the cool thing is you can even do this in groups. You can do this with people. But when you do it in groups, it's once again for the purpose not of discussing or asking questions like we're talking about in the previous lectures. But this specific method is for experiencing God through reading the Bible. And of course, all the other methods, methods you can use. I'm not saying only use this method because I think it's definitely proper and necessary and needed to use the methods where you are talking, arguing, debating, questioning the text. But this is for the experience. So I suggest you try this. And as you do it more and more and more, it becomes a devotion. It becomes a personal practice. And once again, don't stress out about it. Don't feel like, oh, I have to, let me start at Genesis 1 and then next day Genesis 2, next day Genesis 3. You can do that if you want. But if you're going to do things in order like that, that's usually a form of um, staying at the level of what does it say. And you can do that for the whole, you can do Lectio Divina for the entire Bible. But for this, try to just go through different passages however you want, as long as you want. All for you. So, and I'm going to give you some passages to read and to do Lectio Divina on your own. There you go. Thanks for watching. Okay, now what? I'm going to give you a bunch of practices here. So I suggest you pause during this as I give you different suggestions of what to do, different ways of approaching the Bible, where to look it up in the Bible, and then keep coming back to this video. The first practice is based on the first lecture of reading mythopoetically. I want you to pick one of these passages one or more, and then go through the passage mythopoetically, looking at it as a story, looking at it even as a poem, seeing it at its deeper level, beyond literal. Yeah, and once you do that, we're gonna do a practice based on the second lecture of letting the Bible critique you. And so I want you to go through one or more of these passages, and once again, let the Bible critique you, let it, strike you in the heart, cut you to the heart, cut you to the mind, and get you thinking of, how can I be different? 
instead of approaching it, how could this text be different? How can this story be different? How could God be different? How could this character be different? No, no, no. For this practice, read one or more of these passages, and while you're reading it, thinking, how can I be different? What is the storyteller trying to tell me of how I could change? And the last practice, we're going to go through Lectio Divina. So go through one or more of these passages, and then go through those four steps of to read, to meditate, to pray, and to contemplate. And once again, check out the free course that we got. Go check on the other courses, and we go way more in depth with it, even ways to do the same exact four-step process with other texts, religious texts, not just the Bible. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed these little practices, and I suggest you keep on doing these. I, I suggest you... Even after you get good at these, try to then approach a story using all three of these methods. Because that is when things get really exciting. And that is when the Bible no longer becomes something of just a product of the mind. But you start to see how and why this Bible has lasted for so long. How and why so many people come to it and then live their lives by it. By doing these things, the Bible comes alive. I really hope you enjoyed this entire course. And even though we went through a lot, we very much are still kind of at the surface here. And we get deeper and deeper and deeper as you do your own study yourself. And so hopefully I gave you some resources, some methods of approaching this thing. and. Probably my biggest hope is that I widened this whole thing up for you a bit more. Because when it's just looked at as a religious book, I think it kind of narrows it. But when it's looked at as a human book, anyone could come to it and anyone could get something out of it. And I want to give you a few more resources, kind of a further reading kind of thing. And these books I'm about to share with you, I got a lot of what I said from some of it from teachings or discussing with other people or Bible college classes I've taken before or, which by the way, I didn't complete. I don't have a degree in, in Bible college, but you don't need one either to know a lot about the Bible. And just from stuff that I don't even remember where I got it from. But here's some further reading. Reading the Bible for the first, reading the Bible again for the first time by Marcus J. Borg. Taking the Bible seriously, but not literally. That's one of my favorite subtitles ever. And Marcus Borg is one of my favorite people, hands down, ever. Marcus Borg is a religious scholar, very well known for bringing historical Jesus studies to the layman, to all of us. And this book helped shape a lot of things for me. It goes through the entire Bible, section by section, and gives you another way of looking at it, to take the Bible seriously, but not literally. Another one, Karen Armstrong, another pr probably the most famous author that I'm going to show you. And she's a religion scholar, and she just goes through the history of how the Bible came together, how the Torah came together, how scripture came together, how the Gospels came together, and then how we ended up with things like Sola Scriptura, which I was talking about before. Really brilliant author. Now this one I'm going to show you is the most simple book out of all of these. If you want just a super duper simple way of reading this stuff, or maybe just a starter here, we got What is the Bible? How an ancient library of poems, letters, and stories can transform the way you think and feel about everything by Rob Bell. Super long subtitle, super awesome book. And this is super similar to the goal that I was hoping to give you guys is to approach this as a non-religious book. He very much opens it up as what the Bible actually is, which is for everyone and actually for everyone. And he goes through plenty of different stories, jumping all over the place, but in a beautiful way and just reads it with you. This isn't actually really about what the Bible is or how we got the Bible, but really just reading it with you, using a lot of methods that I went through in this course, but just doing it in like real time. Super simple, super awesome. And then we got another book by Rob Bell called Jesus Wants to Save Christians. 
a manifesto for the church in exile. And this is where I first started to see the pattern that we're talking about with the narrative in the Bible with Egypt, Sinai, Jerusalem, Babylon. That was pointed out in here and was called New Exodus Theology. So this book is super awesome. And then also not only goes through the narrative of the Bible, but talks about how the purpose of the church should also now today be a tribe that blesses all the other tribes. Now this one, Wearing God. I love this title. Wearing God, clothing, laughter, fire, and other overlooked ways of meeting God by Lauren F. Winner. Ooh, this book is amazing. She goes through different metaphors for God that is found in the Bible. Uh, first one is the metaphor for God as friend, the metaphor for God as clothing, the metaphor for God as smell, the metaphor for God as bread and vine, God as laboring woman, God as laughter, God as flame, and more. She just goes on and on and gives us brilliant insight behind each of these metaphors, how they can apply today, and how you can find a new love for reading the Bible and a new love for how you see God in general. Because God isn't that consistent of a character in the Bible. God seems to come to people all throughout the Bible in plenty of different ways for different reasons with different motives because God is beyond our language and conception, so therefore any language we can have around God is always metaphor. Here's another one. How to read the Bible and still be Christian, struggling with divine violence from Genesis through Revelation by John Dominic Crossan. John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg have even written a lot of books together because they're both historical Jesus scholars and have really helped bring those studies to everybody else. And it's interesting, this title kind of somewhat seems opposite of the title of this course, but the reason it's called And Still Be Christian is because so many Christians find themselves growing up with the Bible and going through it and trying to get something out of it, but kind of get discouraged when they come through, when they get to the violent parts, when they get to the parts where it seems like God is kind of mean or kind of heartless or kind of merciless. This goes through the Bible section by section and gives the historical context tons and tons and tons of historical context in this. So much so that if you don't like historical context, you'll probably find this boring. If you like historical context, you'll find this mind-blowing and amazing. And it goes through it and talks about pretty much what we're talking about with the text and travail. How the whole um, three steps forward, two steps back thing that we're talking about. And how God is trying to push them forward, but it is difficult when you try to get humans to run with this thing. Super amazing book. Last one. This one isn't just about the Bible, but has a huge chunk of it about the Bible. A New Kind of Christianity, 10 Questions That Are Transforming the Faith by Brian D. McLaren. And let's see here. Here's the, let's just go through the 10 questions. The first question is the narrative question, which is what, you, what is the narrative of the Bible? How do we approach the Bible? When I, went, when I drew that whole thing of the six line narrative, that was from this book that I first saw it. And then the authority question, which is, is the Bible our ultimate authority? Is the church our ultimate authority? Where does authority ultimately come from in the 21st century of religion? Then the God question, let's talk about God. The Jesus question, the gospel question, the church question, the sex question, the future question, the pluralism question, and finally the what do we do now question. Yeah, if you're looking for a totally different way of seeing Christianity, a more progressive way of Christianity, then this is a good book to start with. Super easy to read. So there you go. I hope you guys, like I said, use the resources I gave you. I just gave you a whole bunch to dive even further. But like I said, what's gonna really help you dive further is by actually doing it, actually engaging with this ancient wonderful text as hold on rob bell describes it an ancient library of poems letters and stories 
that transform the way you think and feel about everything. So let this book come alive for you. See this book as the human book as it is. And let's approach it together. If you want to follow me at all, if you're interested in the stuff I'm saying, I'm doing plenty of other stuff. We're going to keep releasing courses on here, of course, but I'm also on YouTube, youtube.com slash Damon Garcia, where I do vlogs and talking videos and just try to give you a bunch of value for free on there. And I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at who is Damon. So I'd love to engage with you guys. Follow me on there. Hit me up. Drop some comments. Send me some messages being like, hey, yo, I listened to your course. It was awesome. Or hey, yo, I listened to your course and I didn't get any of it. Then we could just talk about it. Anyway, thank you for watching. I appreciate you guys. And I hope to see you guys soon. Mm -hmm.